Audiobook Title Mix Audiobook Collection 005 Weapon Seller in the World of Magic Chapter 425 A Supreme Being with Mysterious Origins In a couple of minutes, Shang Fu met the Supreme Realm Expert, who came all the way from the Dragon Empire. He was old with wrinkles all over his body, looking like a bag of bones. Emperor Shan, let me introduce myself. My name is Wang Ming and I'm a traveling adventurer. I heard about the war and I'm here to help you. Unlike Xiang Wen who just trusts Mark's words, Xiang Fu has already confirmed the existence of the gold dragon in Western Yan. Just this early morning, Jin Long was received grandly by Feng Wu and he didn't do it in secret either. All the citizens living in Gong City witnessed the majestic dragon too. This confirmation only increased Xiang Fu's worry. And the appearance of a supreme realm expert looked like a blessing from heaven. However, Xiang Wei won't be fooled like his father. He immediately inquired the reason behind his action, but, why? Venerable Wang, you must know that we have enemies of the same caliber as you. To which, the traveler let out a smile, I'm not risking my life for fun either. You can pay me with something I desire. What is it? Asked the emperor. He further added, anything you desire, it is yours. The traveler answered, your second child, Shang Wen. What do you mean? Shang Fu abruptly stood up from his seat in shock and furrowed his brows in displeasure. The traveler continued to maintain his smile as he waved his hand, you misunderstood me. What I mean is that I want him as my disciple. I heard about his righteous qualities and his talent. With the power of the phoenix running through his blood, he is a perfect person to inherit my knowledge. He will still be your son but won't be able to serve as the general. I'm almost at the end of my life span and I realized that it is almost impossible to make the breakthrough to become the demigod. Rather than expending my life force to chase an impossible dream, I decided to use my cultivation for something great. If your son becomes my disciple, within a few years, I will not only make him a master but also let him inherit my cultivation before I die. After my death, he will return to his homeland as the supreme being. Who knows, he might be able to even become a demigod within a century or two. Everything depends on your choice, Emperor Shan. Whatever you decide, take it very soon. I'm leaving after sunset. If not him, then, I will find another. The world didn't lack geniuses with potential. Shang Wei didn't expect not only this supreme realm expert to turn out to be supreme being but he is also interested to make Shang Wen his disciple. Adding on top of that, he will also help them in the war. Shang Wei felt like the goddess of luck has smiled upon the empire. Meanwhile, the emperor stayed silent. The supreme being from far away lands was taken to the guest room to take a rest, leaving the emperor in deep thought. He was reluctant to send him away. As the third prince returned to the private chamber and saw his father sitting there and thinking, he spoke, Your majesty, this is a fortune for us. Brother is very lucky. But, for me, it sounded like I was asked to sell my kid for a favor, replied the emperor. He then looked at him and said, we don't need his assistance to be honest. Yes, but we cannot prolong this war any longer. The more Feng Wu stays on the land, the higher the chance he will discover the existence of the mines and that tomb. There's a high chance it has already been discovered by the third party who was helping him out. But, we should be fine as long as the Leon Empire or the Dragon Empire learn of it. Or else, it would be a huge trouble. That is why we need him. And don't think too much, your majesty. Just think of it as you are sending him a conquest for a few years. Hum. Meanwhile, at M.T. Lan, Lan Jingai returned from the graveyard and confronted the Zeng. She demanded the release of her daughter once again. In response, the Scarlet Leopard let out a chuckle and replied, You and I don't belong to this world. You married someone. That's fine with me but you shall not involve in the wars of these natives. Of course, as your daughter who awakened my late master's bloodline, Shang Jia shall not involve in the war between Phoenix Empire and the Western Yan either, whatever the result might be. Until this is over, your daughter will be safe with me and you will not cross the Imperial City. You are allowed to defend your family at your home though. I hope you understand what I'm saying, Lan Jingai. Lan Jingai stared at him in silence. Meanwhile, Shang Wen was filled with confusion. Lan Jingai getting herself involved in this war? She is just a mortal without any ether energy. Shang Jia might have some impact with her six circle realm cultivation but the enemies are supreme beings. 
It just doesn't make sense unless Zeng was actually protecting them out of his affection for the Lan family. Then, what of his conspiracy theory about Lan Jing being the mastermind? His views didn't change much. Mankind is always afraid of the unknown. Rather than thinking that there might be a mysterious enemy, even a righteous person like Xiang Wen couldn't help but believe that the Eastern Sun Kingdom is the enemy because, then, everything would just make sense. Genesis Weapon Store, Imperial City. There was a strange silence in the store and everyone appeared very bored. Sai it's been two days since the last customer. Placing her head on the desk, Song Yu complained. Well, it's not like they went out of popularity. It is just that the entire city is in a lockdown state where the soldiers aren't even letting the people leave or enter the city without permission. With the markets closed, the food supply was being taken care of by the Imperial Palace. Of course, Mark has no problem with the ingredients as he has already procured one year worth of food and meat from various sources and loaded them into his inventory before the start of the war. However, his business has been impacted slightly. In the current situation, he cannot go to the Western Moon's branch for business purposes as he wants to lie low and make sure he doesn't gain any suspicion from the Imperial Palace. Hence, he decided to send a trusted subordinate to sell the weapons. Alan is out of the equation as his movements also attract attention. Zima isn't trustable. Ma cannot bear to send away his fiancé. The Zen and the Gold Dragons are doing their own missions. Mark was left with only Chanto, the Welpire. However, he won't send him away alone. For this project, he has a card up his sleeve. That ace is none other than Meng Tao, who was recruited during the Dragon Warrior tournament but wasn't used yet. Today is the day Mark decided to use this hidden ace. Everyone else was waiting for a customer while he was waiting for Meng Tao to arrive. System vs. Rebirth. Chapter 764 Observation. Are you serious? Nicole's eyebrows twitched. I mean, do you not have any objections regarding their relationship? As much as I don't want to admit it, Anna was kind of, horrible in the past. You said it yourself. It was in the past. Dimitri shook his head helplessly. Everyone could change. If I don't give them a chance just because of what happened in the past, then that person might not be able to change anymore. Besides, there are not a lot of people who can stand on equal ground with my master. In this kingdom alone, there are only two women who can be considered worthy to be my master's wife. One of them is Anna, while the other is the Sword Arbiter's daughter, Sword Princess Zera. However, I can't wrap my head around an Arbiter, especially that old man, so I think Anna is the best candidate. Of course, there is also a candidate from neighboring countries. Dimitri glanced at Damien. Comma, such as the rumored hidden genius princess, the second princess of the Greenwood Kingdom, Princess Livia. And her biggest contender should be the Prime Minister's daughter, a business genius. Comma, Damien fell silent for a moment. You surely have prepared for all of this, haven't you? How much have you investigated? I don't understand what you mean. I am simply thinking about the Ardigan family's future in my mind. Seeking the wife for the master is the butler's job, you know. Dimitri looked away. If I tell you to cooperate with me for matchmaking, what will you do? Damien asked with a nonchalant expression, but the question seemed to be extremely important. I would definitely cooperate unless my master tells me otherwise. Comma, Damien and Dimitri looked at each other as if they were trying to negotiate. However, Damien ended up sighing saying, he is simply too much. I'm just afraid that he will end up causing a disaster instead. Are you cursing my master? Dimitri squinted his eyes. Of course not. Damien shrugged. Hello, you guys. Why are you talking like Anna is irrelevant? You talk like Anna will end up marrying him. Shouldn't you question whether Anna wants him or not? Don't you know that Anna is extremely beautiful and powerful? There are a lot of people wanting to marry her. Nicole raised her hand, interrupting them. Damien and Dimitri only looked at her like she was a fool. What are you talking about? We are already aware of her reputation. But her action here has shown enough that she is at least interested in him. Their movements are in sync, so what do you want to say? Damien tilted his head in confusion. That's right. Even if she has a lot of suitors, does it really matter if she isn't planning to accept them? I've heard that a lot of those guys are scared because of her eccentric behavior in the past. Dimitri nodded in agreement. Why do I feel like I'm the one being bullied? Nicole let out a sigh. Then, let's change the topic. What do you think about the skill they are learning right now? 
Dimitri thought for a moment and said, it's quite a peculiar technique. Instead of relying on the spirit abilities, that technique is actually forcing us to learn how to control spiritual energy in its purest form. Damien agreed with him. Normally, the control is divided into two categories, soft and hard approaches. However, it's simply controlling the ability according to the purpose. Meanwhile, this technique controls the spiritual energy itself. If we infuse our element or spirit ability, there is a chance. Dimitri nodded. Yeah. There is a chance that a sword wave can be used as something else, like a barrier or something. Of course, it's not good to use an offensive ability as a defensive one, but if you put up your guard, this ability allows you to maximize it. In other words, the purpose of this ability is to bring the full potential of the ability that can't be exerted in its original form. That sounds extremely powerful. Does that make the trip worth it? Nicole asked, especially Damien, who came from another country. Of course. I've been trying to do the same, but it's harder than I expected. Still, if I continue observing them and try to replicate them, it should be enough to increase my overall abilities. If a person like Dimitri uses it, he won't have to be afraid of a spirit transcendence anymore. Bringing this information alone is worth multiple trips. I don't really care about the Moodle Kingdom. But if my master wants to spread the knowledge, I'll respect his will. Either way, it's enough if it makes him stronger. Dimitri shook his head. Fair point. Why don't you just move to the Greenwood Kingdom? We'll definitely take care of you. Damien smirked. Shut up. While those two were arguing, Noel and Anna seemed to have woken up from their meditation. They immediately returned to the house. After dinner, Noel continued his training since he was just one step away from completing the training. To avoid alerting Noel, Anna also did the same training while making it look like she was struggling with it. In another three hours, Noel finally managed to complete the training by wrapping his body with a thin layer of spiritual energy. Even his training task was completed since it only required him to last for one second. Ha <laughs> ha. I finally completed the training. Noel immediately stood up, proudly claiming. Exclamation point, Anna widened her eyes in shock and said with a gasp. What? How? He? It must be because of my talent. Noel harumphed. K.H. Anna gritted her teeth, looking very frustrated. I was just a bit away from it. Since you lose, you better prepare to say something against your will. Noel smirked evilly. Anna looked unwilling, but she ended up snorting, HMPH. Try it. I don't care. All right then. You have to say this. Noel took out a piece of paper containing two words. Say it. Anna read the words written on it out loud without putting much thought into it. But those words suddenly caused him to think about it. After all, those two words were, I win. Ha! Anna soon noticed the meaning and raised her head, looking at Noel's face, which had completely become serious as if he had realized that she was merely pretending. Chapter 765 Punishment? Ha! Anna looked at Noel, who was glaring at him with a grim expression. It seemed that he had already known about it the whole time. Anna made an awkward smile, trying to play dumb. Why are you telling me to say those words? Noel's expression became cold. Are you seriously asking that question? Comma, Anna felt like Noel would become more pissed if she continued doing this. She thought for a moment and asked, Since when did you figure it out? From the very start. It was my fault for having my thoughts getting distracted, so it would be weird if you were later than me. That was why when I reached the last stage, I kept a portion of my attention to check on you. Anna made an awkward smile. Their competitiveness might be high, but their fairness seemed to be beyond it. Just like how Anna wanted to concede the win to him, Noel also didn't like to win without his own effort. Then, are you sure you're going to say the words I'm going to tell you? Anna asked. Noel looked away with a distorted expression. You look so annoyed. Anna's eyebrows twitched. If you don't like it, why would you even bother to make me the winner again? I don't want to say those words, but I hate unfairness even more. This is not a battle of wits where trickery can be applied. So, since I've lost, I'll follow it through. Noel sighed. In that case, let me think about it first. What kind of thing do I want you to say? Anna looked up for a few minutes before grabbing a paper and writing down her order. Say this. When Noel picked up the paper, his expression was distorted. Are you kidding me? It's your fault. I've let you win, so you should have taken it if you don't want to do it. Anna shrugged while looking away. 
Noel gritted his teeth. Since he had given her the right once again, he had to go through it. He burned the paper with his flame and started unbuttoning his shirt. Eh? Anna widened her eyes in shock. Why are you unbuttoning your shirt? They were sitting in front of each other, but somehow Noel made his way to her bed while taking off his shirt. What's wrong? Noel smiled as he approached her. Anna didn't know what Noel was planning to do. In fact, this was the first time she experienced something like this. Noel was right before her, and their bodies were only separated by a few centimeters. She couldn't help but try to move back, but Noel didn't let her go. He grabbed her hands while asking, What's wrong? Why are you backing down? I am supposed to be the one asking you. What are you doing? Anna became even more flustered. Her cheeks reddened. I'm simply following your instructions. Noel smirked. Since you told me to say it, then I should act like it as well. You, Anna wanted to stop him, but Noel's face was right before her. With his hands holding her, she couldn't move away anymore. Her face was completely red, while Noel's eyes were so gentle that she even felt some affection reflected on them. I am Noel's stargaze. So, shouldn't I act like I'm one? Noel smirked, Madam. You don't have to run anymore. Anna's body trembled. This was beyond her imagination. She never thought Noel could act this affectionately. Her muscles tensed up as her brain froze. She was ready for what Noel was planning to do because, surprisingly, she didn't feel any repulsive feelings. But in that instant, a wide evil grin appeared on Noel's face. The smile was filled with salt as even a dense person would feel the insult behind it. She realized that Noel had once again tricked her. You? You? Anna had a hard time speaking, both angry and flustered. What do you mean? I have said everything you want me to say, but the bet doesn't specify that I can't do anything nor say something different from those lines. Noel smirked. I don't know what you've seen from that alternate world, but shouldn't you be more mature because of those experiences? I guess it's not really affecting your mental age. You are too innocent in this after all. Ha ha ha. Noel stepped back while laughing out loud. Even if he lost the bet, he still won the war. Anna was so flustered that she couldn't even talk back. Anna looked down as her expression darkened. Her body was shaking because of the shame. Meanwhile, Noel was putting on his shirt back with a big smile on his face. You? Anna grabbed his shoulders in shame, pushing him down. You bastard. I'm going to make you pay. We're going to bet once more. We'll see who comes first in the next stage of training. Whoever wins can order the other party to do and say anything they want. Noel harumphed. Do you think I'm afraid of you? Obviously, the training task that increased his sensitivity would be the main boss that would allow him to win this competition. However, Anna seemed to be serious about winning this time, no matter what she had to do. Just wait. I'm going to make you do this and that while saying those words. I'm going to repay all this shame. Anna bit her lips. Fine. So, can you get off me now? Noel asked. Exclamation point, Anna realized that their position was something that shouldn't be talked about among nobles. In fact, it would lead to the point where this would lead to a big scandal. Anna hurriedly released him and stepped back. She wanted to say something, but she ended up clutching her head, never thinking she was bold enough to do such a thing. Ah ah. You sly fox, I'm definitely going to make you suffer this humiliation. You won't be able to do it because I'll win this time. Noel harumphed. Epic of Ice Dragon, reborn as an ice dragon with a system. Chapter 1386 Intense Clash. Unk. And why am I growing weaker and slower? This is not just the time divinity within the ocean water. The Flame Emperor noticed his body beginning to grow weaker through a strange divine curse-like aura. This power was exuded by all four of Drake's divine weapons, possessing the ability to weaken their foe through a combination of many attacks at once. Such as Divine Sea Dragon's Fang, increases all damage dealt by plus 200%, ignores minus 30% of the target's total magic defense, can pierce through spatial distortion barriers and deal direct damage. Whenever an attack hit a target, there's a 50% chance to inflict a debuff that decreases the target's physical strength and magical power by minus 5% for 5 minutes, which can stack up to minus 50%. The reason why Drake's weapons were so special was because of their amazing abilities, 
and the power to pierce through defenses, and even the spatial distorting barriers that the Flame Emperor was now wielding into his own Flame Sword was becoming incredibly useful now. Divine Spirit Creation, Divine Ocean Dragon God's Wrath. And as if things couldn't get any worse for the Flame Emperor once more, Drake unleashed the might of his Divine Spirit Creation ability, summoning a gigantic spiritual entity that fused itself into his spear, shaping itself into a pair of titanic dragon moors, engulfing the Flame Emperor and pushing him into the floor yet again. Splyre Ash. Uark. The Flame Emperor felt frustrated more than pained, his flames flickered before the might of Drake's oceanic magic, forcing him to go beyond his current limits, and show the power he has been saving for much later. Primordial Flames of the End. Flujosh. What? Drake was suddenly overwhelmed by an enormous wave of black flames, darker than ever before and more monstrous and aberrant than what he had fought against beforehand. Covering his armor and weapon with his beginning flames, he quickly unleashed a barrage of attacks, and then nine dragon breaths to just hold the wave for a few seconds. Ha ha. Struggling, are you? The flame emperor floated in midair. You've been a rather powerful foe, but this will be as far as you go, Dragon King. Primordial Flames of the End Embodiment The Flame Emperor's entire body was engulfed by his own flames, as he burned to ashes, only to transform into the flames themselves. He became a titan made of black flames, overflowing with the power to end it all. Drake's flame of beginning were powerful, but they could barely resist the improved version of the Fire of the End, the Primordial Flames of the End. Burn? The Flame Emperor stepped forwards, his entire body creating thousands of meteors that all fell over Drake, the Dragon King's armor and defenses were instantly pierced, his barriers shattered one after another. Boom. 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 Despite his amazing enhancements, buffs, divine weapons, and abilities, Drake was constantly being pushed back, even as he was trying to fight back even knowing that he was already reaching the limits of what he could achieve. I can't let him beat me yet. Serta had yet to level up enough to reach rank 8. Drake wanted Serta to at the very least reach that rank, so his powers when transformed, could reach the same height as rank 10 gods. For that reason, he had got beyond his limits and even as his body was being constantly burned into ashes and regenerated again, he had to try. Absolute Abyssal Blood World. Holy Sun. Flames of Beginnings. Winter Magic. Drake conjured three divine abilities together, and then imbued the powers of his divine spirit, Gabriel, into them. Celestial Dragon's Heavenly Frost Star Shower. Around his regenerating body, Drake conjured over a hundred miniature worlds imbued solely with pure and divine light. Gabriel's shining divinity imbued into all of them. With a furious roar, he fired all of them against the Flame Emperor at once, his gigantic blazing body started taking the damage, as enormous holes began to open across his ethereal self. B-O-O-O-M. 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 Boom. Urg. The Flame Emperor groaned, materializing a larger gram and swinging it around, cutting down the stars falling over his body as he constantly regenerated almost endlessly. Quite annoying, aren't you? You just can't never give up, how? With a furious roar, he generated yet another gram, rushing towards Drake as his two blazing swords clashed against the Dragon King's four divine weapons fused as a giant frost made trident. Clash! 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 Crash! Drake did his best to resist, unleashing more of his stars along the side waves of time-stopping sea waves, but that was only bringing him so far, due to the spatial distortion abilities, with his feeble understanding of the element of time, Drake's spells could be easily stopped or blocked. Before being a Dragon King, you know what I am, Flame Emperor. Drake roared, his entire body constantly regenerating the deadly wounds he was tanking, his armor was melting and regenerating constantly as well. However, the Flame Emperor suddenly felt, an incredible chill. His flames flickered, as a wave of incredibly powerful cold started spreading everywhere. Drake's entire body started to change as well, his colorful scales changing to clear blue and silver colors, his heads combining together into a single, larger one. His entire body covered in countless layers of sturdy as diamond's ice. The power of all his ice divinities and divine abilities combined together, his divine weapons further imbuing their power into him, and even the Frost Queen's manifestation seemed to be lending him a part of her frost might. I am an ice dragon. With a gigantic mass of ice over his arm, Drake punched the Flame Emperor's blazing body, crushing him into the ground, his eyes melted constantly, 
but it also constantly regenerated, covering the Flame Emperor over and over again. Raya! Grunar! The roar of two powerful monarchs echoed across the entire continent of Muspelheim, their clash of divinities reaching heights never seen before in thousands of years within this landscape. Crack, 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 crash. However, Drake's eyes kept breaking, shattering, and melting. The Flame Emperor's flames were slowly overpowering him at the end. Sadly for you, an ice dragon cannot beat the might of my flames. The Flame Emperor laughed, destroying all the ice above his body. Only to be greeted by a gigantic mass of white flames. But he can. Drake smiled, pointing at Serta that had just arrived, his aura exuding the power of a rank 8 divine fire dragon. I'm ready. W what? He's here. The Flame Emperor suddenly stepped back as he tried to run away from the gigantic sphere of white flames, only for the flames to grow larger, engulfing him into a gigantic explosion. Boom! The white flames battled against the black flames, like two forces that negated one another. However, with Drake's support on his flames of beginning, the flames of origin from Serta received an unexpected boost, further overwhelming the Flame Emperor. H how come he has grown this powerful? T that damn lizard! The Flame Emperor battled the flames, struggling pointlessly as Surtur and Drake rushed towards him together now that he was weakened. Show him what you've got, kid. I will. Clara Ash. Chapter 1387 Surtur joins the battle. Just as Drake was starting to think about how to stop the Flame Emperor once he got past his winter magic, Surtur arrived, having done the impossible and successfully evolving to rank 8. His appearance looked almost the same as before, but he gained several golden-colored linings across his body, alongside a set of natural-scale armor of gold color across his body, with three huge, golden-colored horns above his head. The red orb fragment that he was holding, a gift of the chief of the fire giant village was now fused into his forehead, overflowing with great power that was given to him by the fragment, who willingly imbued him with its divinity, while the flame emperor had to corrupt the fragments so they would obey him. So you're here. So what? Another lizard in the frying pan won't make a difference. And your white flames are much weaker than mine. Your mastery over the origin flames cannot be compared to my own over the flames of the end. The flame emperor proudly regenerated the damage he was taking, his gigantic body made of flames of the end kept spreading around, growing stronger as he consumed anything on his path, even his own army of divine beasts. I'll burn you two until nothing remains. Infernal Abyssal Flame Vortex. With a furious, monstrous roar, the Titan of Flames unleashed three gigantic spiraling vortexes of black flames at the end, which flew directly towards the two divine dragons. Flurosh. Prepare yourself to receive it, Serta. Said Drake. You know how to wield your powers better now, don't make the training we had go to waste, kid. Understood. Serta roared, his divinity of origin flames erupting from his body at an incredibly powerful pace, his hands quickly beginning to materialize a huge sword out of them, his own scales, blood, and the souls of the other fire dragons. Divine Blazing Soul Dragon Sword, Maspel. The gigantic divine sword materialized with the help of his unique skill as well, the, unique skill, Heavenly Smith. Drake knew that it was impossible for Serta to ever catch up with his strength in the conventional ways, so he made sure to train him on using his unique abilities to his best capabilities. Raya R. With a furious dual roar, Drake and Serta rushed across the two vortexes of flames of the end fearlessly, slashing through them with their powerful divine weapons. Slaya Ash. Two waves of origin flames and flames of beginning pierced through both vortexes, the black flames distorted and then exploded, opening the way for the dragons to rush in, approaching the flame emperor. Wah! The flame emperor felt slightly unease. This can't be. How come he? No, it's impossible for him to become a threat to me in such little time. The dragon kings must be strong, but this kid, he's nobody for me to worry about. He quickly greeted the two divine dragons with his huge arms, clashing against them while unleashing constant spatial severing slashes of black flames with his two grams. However, Surtur's misspell, carrying the might of several divine dragon souls, was stronger. Divine blazing dragon soul summoning, infernal dragon triad manifestation. 
and Serta wasn't done yet, unleashing yet another three divine dragon souls out of his own body, the other three he had out of the six siblings that had joined him so far, their powers quickly merging into his own aura, while at the same time materializing into a stronger armor above his body. With this technique and the Maspell Sword, each slash coming from Serta unleashed a catastrophic explosion of white flames, which dissipated and distorted the black flames of the Emperor. In fact, he was doing it so easily that the Emperor could no longer fake his composure. Boom. 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 B-O-O-M. W what have you become? How? Incapable of understanding how Serta has gone so far with his understanding of the origin flames in just a few days since becoming a god, the flame emperor realized a large part of his blazing body was being corroded by white flames, slowly consuming his own self. Are you seriously asking how now? Drake laughed, showering the emperor with celestial frozen stars. Because you're just wasting your time. The moment I appeared here, the fate of Serta changed forever, flame emperor. B-O-O-M. 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 U-U-R-G-H-H. The Flame Emperor already had his hands full with evading and attacking Serta, but Drake was still there pestering him with powerful blows that he could no longer afford to waste time on regenerating quickly. As his body was already weakened as it is, Serta rushed forward, attacking his back, and unleashing a barrage of powerful slashing strikes, each one sliced apart a piece of the Flame Emperor's blazing body, while making it explode, effectively making his own mass grow smaller. Slash. 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 Boom. 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 U-A-A-R-G-H. Ugh. You damn brat. Eight-armed abyssal flames azure. The Flame Emperor's entire body quickly shapper shifted, leaving the form of a mere fire giant, and taking the appearance of an eight-armed Herculean beast his eight muscular arms made of flames unleashing a barrage of fist attacks that generated cataclysmic shockwaves. Serta was forcefully pushed back. Crash. 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 Ugh. S shit. My arm is breaking apart already. Serta quickly realized he was being overwhelmed, he alone could not beat the flame emperor, but it wasn't as if he had gotten too self-conceited like before. He knew Drake was right there. Don't forget I'm right here. Flame Emperor. Divine Frozen Sea Dragon King's Mighty Frost Fangs. Combining the element of winter magic into his previous technique, Drake swung his combined divine weapons, now in the shape of a huge spear, as he pierced the Flame Emperor only once, but that single strike generated a gigantic explosion of frost and sea magic, engulfing half of his body into pure ice. Boom. Grahir. The Flame Emperor could not easily take such amount of damage from the back, even less as he had been weakened by Serta severely already, his body started to crumble apart, his flames did not respond to him anymore. T this is impossible. It can't be. M.E. Losing to some lizards. Well, you better believe it. Serta roared furiously, descending from above and piercing the Flame Emperor's exposed soul with his blazing sword. Cry Ash. Chapter 1388 The Flame Emperor's Trump Card T this can't be true. The Flame Emperor muttered. His entire soul started shattering apart, several pieces of it were flying away, his strength beginning to quickly fade away. The blazing body he had created to become even stronger ended being his ultimate demise, as it exposed his soul too much when it took damage. And with a sword made out of the materialization of the origin flames, fire dragon souls, and Serta's own scales and blood, the very last fire dragon managed to overpower the flame emperor. I I can't, die like this. This? Ugh. No matter how hard the ancient fire giant tried to struggle, his struggle seemed to be absolutely pointless. His black flames were being overpowered by Serta's origin flames and Drake's beginning flames. The later were much weaker, he could overpower them on his own. However, because of Serta's appearance, the beginning flames became an unexpected boost to Serta's origin flames, that even now were slightly weaker than his flames of the end. Both magical flames are said to be the strongest types of fire magic, whose origins are not from the dragons, nor even the world of Yggdrasil. The origin of these flames was from a certain someone, the pinnacle of fire-wielding gods, the venerable of flames who governed the world with his blazing wrath in the past. These damn flames that took us so long to acquire. The Flame Emperor thought. Will it all be for nothing? Will it be for hun- However, in the few seconds left he had, suddenly, he felt something. The connection with the four hounds he had created long ago suddenly started to waver, until all four shattered. 
their lives were taken away. The four hounds, died. The flame emperor muttered these words as his body and soul fell from the skies, Serta piercing them with his sword. Yeah. Too bad for you, old man. Laughed Serta. And now you're the one that's going to go join them in hell. Serta swung his sword several times, dividing the flame emperor's soul even more, slicing it apart as he groaned in agony. Slash. 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 Graha. Ha. However, in between his screams of agony, Serta suddenly felt, unease. The flame emperor started to laugh as he was sliced into pieces. Why is he laughing? Serta thought, seconds before something happened. Fly ash. A bright, red light emerged from all of the flame emperor's soul fragments, as tendrils of infernal flames emerged out of them all, merging together. What the? Serta was taken aback, but before he could properly react, something even crazier happened. It felt as if the flame emperor was regaining power out of nowhere. Ha! Ha ha ha! You've given me a favor for killing those useless dogs, you foolish lizards! Through them! A powerful shockwave of divine black flames emerged out of the flame emperor as his soul reconstructed itself, Serta was overwhelmed, quickly thrown away at an incredibly fast speed. Grua Ugg! Drake quickly flew to his rescue, grabbing him as he flew across the skies, the two fell into silence as they saw the flame emperor be reborn. Four different powers he did not originally possess began swirling inside of his soul, the voices of the four hounds screaming in agony as their ethereal forms were devoured. His blazing body took a new shape and colors as countless purple flames melded with his black flames, swirling into a gigantic titan made of infernal fire. The blazing body he had acquired evolved, as the poisonous flames of Jormungand emerged with his primordial flames of the end. And then, to top it off, several monstrous infernal beasts' heads, limbs, tails, and eyes started popping out of his blazing body constantly, an army of monsters made of these deadly flames was being created. His body then gained a shining red armor, demonic in appearance, alongside a huge red and silver sword, overflowing with powerful bright sunlight. This bastard. He acquired the powers of the four hounds after they were defeated. Ben Ladin asked in shock in the distance, as she was finished crushing a dozen rank nine divine beasts fused with Miranda. T this can't be. But their souls were destroyed, I felt it. Miranda said in surprise. That armor and that sword, they're identical to the equipment that guy you killed was using. Right? Yuki wondered, standing over the corpse of a divine beast. Why yeah? Picora muttered. But how? To obtain their powers he should have at least eaten their souls, but their souls were destroyed by us. Didn't we eat him? But even then, we didn't get any power from him. Tisha suddenly realized something that they should have noticed earlier. But Blaze is gone. How come her powers, and even her voice is within that monster? Hector couldn't believe what his eyes were seeing. That bastard. What kind of trick did he pull out on us? Larzak roared. Was his plan to have his own loyal servants get killed? What sort of monster is he? Kraxka sighed. The sort of monster that's called the Flame Emperor. Sighed Agni. A monster like him. Is capable of anything. So this was his plan all along? Leona wondered. T those are the powers of the girl we slain. Said Ben Ludra, pointing at the distance. Yeah. Kate nodded. This is bad, we need to go help Papa. Right? Ben Ludra nodded. The pressure. And that mighty sword. Ruby sighed. Even that guy's powers are there. This is, unexpected beyond belief. Rakasha said. The Flame Emperor kept laughing through his transformation, constantly sending shockwaves of energy that didn't allow anybody to get closer to him. Once his transformation finished, a titan covered on blazing red armor, which slowly turned deep black, holding a sword that could slice a mountain, surrounded by hundreds of infernal beasts made of black and purple flames emerged. Not only did he exude the already overwhelming power of black flames of the end, but the powers of his subordinates merged with them, turning his strength into something utterly demonic. You have served me well, my hounds. The flame emperor laughed. Now let me avenge you with the powers you've lent to me. Chapter 1389 The True Purpose of the Four Hounds The power of the, flame emperor, s have been amplified by the, black flames of the end stigma. All of the special abilities of the, four hounds, that have taken this stigma have been imbued themselves into his soul into the moment of their deaths. The, flame emperor, acquire the, unique skill, radiant sunlight armor, unique skill, radiant sunshine sword, 
Divine Ability, Jormungandas Abyssal Venomous Flames, Divine Ability, Heaven Flame Sword Arts, and, Divine Ability, Divine Infernal Beast Summon. All inherited abilities have been corrupted by the, Black Flames of the End, and the agony of their original user's death. By the power of the, Black Flames of the End Stigma, the stronger the agony in their deaths, the stronger the abilities will evolve. The, Unique Skill, Radiant Sunlight Armor, and, Unique Skill, Radiant Sunshine Sword, have evolved into the, Unique Skill, Abyssal Star Armor, and, Unique Skill, Abyssal Star Sword. The, Divine Ability, Jormungandas Abyssal Venomous Flames, has evolved into the, Divine Ability, Jormungandas World Ending Miasmic Flames. The, Divine Ability, Heaven Flame Sword Arts, has evolved into the, Divine Ability, Infernal Abyss Flame Sword Arts. The, Divine Ability, Divine Infernal Beast Summon, has evolved into the, Divine Ability, Abyssal Flames of the End Infernal Beast Summon. The system messages kept popping up one after another in front of Drake and all his allies, as they were given a share of the system's powers through the Job system that had strengthened so many before. The Flame Emperor not only had inherited their powers, but based on how agonizing their deaths were, the stronger the abilities inherited became. What sort of sadistic Matherfica are you? Serta couldn't take this anymore, gritting his teeth as he faced the title that had emerged in front of everyone. Ha, huh, I was half expecting something like this. Drake laughed. These bastards, whenever you push them this far, they always have some insane ability saved for the last moment. You don't get to be so strong as them without having several trump cards. Luckily, I do have my own too. Why you think we can defeat him now? He surely has already surpassed rank 10 now. Serta seemed to be losing hope. Serta, can you be losing hope in front of your friends? Asked Drake, looking at the looming titan slowly walking towards them while laughing. Trust me, I've fought my fair deal of insane monsters before. The Dragon King quickly noticed the wave of infernal beasts made out of black flames and purple flames approaching, every one of them was rank 9 at the minimum, with a vast amount of rank 10s too. The Flame Emperor's army of divine beasts and fire giant soldiers was mostly dealt with by now, his army was powerful but Drake's army was much stronger, nonetheless, it seemed that the Flame Emperor had planned his own defeat. He wanted to be the last one laughing no matter what, a tricky, sick bastard. However, Drake knew how to deal with him, the power he could only use every 24 hours, he was saving it for such a moment. It was his strongest trump card ever since he became a god, the special ability within his, unique skill, god. And with this power, he was planning to both weaken the flame emperor, and steal all those fancy abilities he got for himself. But it wasn't as if he could do it now, Drake had to first get closer to him, close enough he could touch his body or soul, touching his armor might not do it, he might need to pierce through it and touch his soul, as he lacked flesh now that he was made of flames. Everyone, the war is not over. Drake roared, glancing at the army of allies and friends behind him. Concentrate in what we can do now. All of you regroup. The surviving divine beasts. Bring the wounded soldiers back to the divine realm. All those that can still fight, join us in the front lines. All right. Let's do this. Ben Ludden roared in her chaos dragon form, descending from the skies. We did it before, we can do it again. Roared Tisha. As long as Lord Drake's leading us. Hector smiled. Papa. We'll help too. Ben Ludra said. Yeah. Kate nodded. The rest cheered as well, Drake was quickly surrounded by his strongest aides, and his wives and children. However, there was a part of the army that couldn't simply cheer up from Drake's words alone. After all, they served another dragon, another leader they wanted to hear their words of inspiration from. Drake glanced back at Surtur, as if trying to tell him something without saying a word. His eyes felt meaningful, as big as they were, Surtur understood what he meant. He gritted his sharp jaws, glancing back at his friends as well, everyone there fighting alongside them. He couldn't leave them without his own words either. After all, he was also a leader. Everyone. We can do this. Don't lose hope. Surtur roared, even if he himself was doubting Drake's words, he could simply not abandon everyone to this despair. If he had to, he would simply fake his enthusiasm and confidence. That's the words a leader must say. Nadia said, landing at the side of Serta, resting her huge axe over her large and muscular shoulders. Her eyes glowed with a fiery fierceness. Well said. Even if a bit sloppy. Mina giggled, 
Her aura of white dragon flames encompassed her body, resembling a saintly veil. H. Hey. I'm trying my best. Serta felt embarrassed. All right, boss. You call me, I come. Jaina said, raising the sword Serta had created for him by reinforcing and enchanting the old, rusty sword of his father. A young leader has many flaws, but through practice we can improve on that. Leona laughed, carrying her brother over a lion flame spirit. Count on me as well, these powers I have won't go to waste. Adney nodded, the rare jewel in his forehead glowed with a divine light. Accompanying there were many fire giant warriors and divine beasts tamed by them that refused to simply run away from danger, from both tribes, unified together to take down the monster that wanted them gone. The fire dragon and the ice dragon armies never felt so unified before, facing an even more dangerous army of beasts together. Title, Dragon Monarch System, 399-403. Comma, Chapter 399-399, A Gathering of Destiny. Attention all readers. We have an exciting announcement to make regarding NovelBin.net. Due to copyright reasons and our commitment to protecting intellectual property, we have transitioned to a brand new platform, NovelUSB.com. This move ensures that you can continue enjoying a wide range of captivating stories while upholding the rights of authors and creators. Join us on NovelUSB.com today and explore an extensive collection of novels, short stories, and comics. We appreciate your understanding and support as we make this transition, and we look forward to providing you with an enhanced reading experience. Chapter 399-399, A Gathering of Destiny. Your Majesty, I have important news to share. The four Western Empires have surrendered. Your troops have instilled fear in them, and they have also heard about the defeat of the Oracle Alliance, the Prime Minister reported. Aditya, sitting on his throne, nodded with satisfaction. He took a sip of the herbal tea that his advisor and his butler, Watson, had prepared for him. That's more good news for the Eastern Empire, he remarked, savouring the soothing taste. The four Western Empires have agreed to sign a non-aggression pact with the Eastern Empire. Additionally, they have decided to offer 500 million gold coins as compensation for their actions, the Prime Minister continued. Aditya nodded again, pleased with the outcome. It's good that those fools have realized their mistakes and surrendered. Otherwise, I wouldn't have spared them, he stated a hint of satisfaction in his voice. Finally, the Eastern Empire could enjoy a period of peace. The time had come to focus on developing the newly acquired territories, improving the lives of their people, and strengthening their military might. Aditya felt a surge of strength within him. After transforming 20,000 soldiers into Dragonians simultaneously, he experienced a brief period of weakness. During that time, he faced some of the toughest challenges of his life. Thankfully, fortune favored him, and he emerged victorious. Curiosity peaked, Aditya took another sip of tea, then set his cup down on the nearby table, fixing his gaze on Spencer. What is it, Spencer? He inquired, his voice filled with anticipation. Your Majesty, it concerns the Hephaestus kingdom, Spencer began, his tone grave. Aditya's expression grew serious as he listened intently. King Adian has suffered significant losses in his troops. He currently lacks the forces needed to suppress the rebels that have risen in the Methia Empire, Spencer explained. The Hephaestus kingdom had been granted control over the Methia Empire, but the nobles, royal family, generals, and other political figures within Methia were reluctant to relinquish their power. Some surrendered but most decided to rebel. Similar challenges were faced by the Eastern Empire when they claimed the Echo Nexus Empire, the Queenstown Empire, and the Usakan Empire. The Echo Dominion Empire had also faced similar resistance. Aditya processed the information, contemplating the situation. The Hephaestus Kingdom's struggle to gain control over the Methia Empire posed a serious concern. The stability of their newfound alliance hinged on resolving this issue. Aditya had a lot on his mind, dealing with important matters within the Eastern Empire. Unfortunately, amidst all the chaos, he completely forgot about the Hephaestus Kingdom, a loyal ally facing their own challenges. As this realization struck him, he couldn't help but feel a pang of regret. I'm sorry, Aditya admitted, sounding genuinely remorseful. I've been so caught up in the affairs of our empire that I neglected the Hephaestus Kingdom. They need a help, and I let it slip my mind. Spencer, understanding the immense burden Aditya carried, nodded sympathetically. Your Majesty, it's understandable. 
You have so much on your plate, especially with our recent expansions. But we must act quickly to support our ally and preserve our alliance. Taking a moment to reflect, Adityre agreed with Spencer's assessment. You're right, Spencer. We can't delay any longer. The Hephaestus Kingdom has been there for us in our times of need, and it's our duty to return the favor. The Hephaestus Kingdom, a crucial ally, was facing a significant challenge. King Adian had lost a substantial portion of his troops, leaving him ill-equipped to handle the rebel uprising in the Methia Empire. Aditya, deep in thought, understood the gravity of the situation. His own troops were already stretched thin, with over two million soldiers engaged in suppressing rebel groups in the newly acquired territories. The remaining forces had been deployed to deal with the four western region empires, and they had yet to return. Aditya pondered his options, knowing that immediate assistance was necessary for the Hephaestus kingdom. He couldn't spare any of his troops, as they were already committed to crucial tasks. However, a possible solution emerged in his mind. The emperor contemplated reaching out to the Echo Dominion Empire for aid. Their alliance had been forged on the principles of unity and cooperation, and now was the time to put those principles into action. A sense of relief crossed Spencer's face as he saw Aditya's determination. Absolutely, your majesty. I suggest we urgently reach out to the Echo Dominion Empire and ask for their assistance. Our alliance is built on unity and cooperation, and now is the time to show our commitment to those values. I was also thinking the same. Aditya nodded, his resolve growing stronger. Get a letter ready immediately. We need to apologize for the delay and ask for their support. Let them know we understand the seriousness of the situation in the Hephaestus kingdom and how urgent their aid is. Spencer, grateful for Aditya's decisive response, smiled appreciatively. I'll start drafting the letter right away, your majesty. We'll emphasize the importance of our alliance and the need to stand together during challenging times. Aditya expressed his gratitude to Spencer, recognizing his dedication. Thank you, Spencer. Your quick action means a lot. Let's make sure the Hephaestus kingdom knows we're fully committed to supporting them. Aditya watched as Spencer hurried off to draft the urgent letter. Aditya couldn't help but feel a sense of responsibility for his forgetfulness and the impact it had on their allies. I must be careful to not repeat the same mistake again. Aditya sat on his throne, deep in thought, contemplating the urgent plans he needed to make. Determined not to overlook anything, he focused on the tasks at hand. Suddenly, the sound of footsteps broke the silence, and Watson, his trusted personal butler, and advisor, entered the throne hall. Aditya welcomed his arrival, feeling it was perfect timing. Watson, you've come at just the right moment, Aditya said, addressing his loyal companion. Could you please write letters to all the nobles of our empire, requesting their presence tomorrow? Due to the ongoing war, we haven't had the opportunity to hold a proper ceremony for the new nobles. I want to organize a royal banquet, where all the nobles can come together. It's essential to foster unity and promote peace within our empire. I believe it's important for our nobles to meet one another. As the Eisterin Empire continued to expand, the number of nobles serving the throne also increased. Aditya recognized the significance of the nobles familiarizing themselves with each other. This royal banquet would provide an opportunity for them to connect and establish relationships. Aditya acknowledged that this was his first time hosting such a social gathering. While he had previously considered such events unimportant, he now realized the value of social gatherings as an essential step in maintaining harmony and cohesion within his empire. Aditya asked Watson, can you make all the arrangements? Watson replied confidently, yes, your majesty. You can trust me to handle everything. I'm good at organizing events, and I won't disappoint you. Aditya smiled and said, that's great. I believe in you, Watson. Thank you for your hard work. It's always a pleasure to serve you, your majesty, Watson said respectfully, bowing to Aditya before leaving the throne hall. Aditya couldn't help but smile upon hearing this. Dash? Dash? Scene change. At Julia's laboratory. Julia, Rhea, and Lara had surrounded Alicia and was asking her many kinds of questions. The girls were still wearing black clothes that they had worn in the morning. It was evening time. Since Aditya was working, the girls came to Julia's laboratory to talk. Yesterday, you spent the whole day and night with Aditya. How was your experience? Comma, which experience are you talking about? You know, that one. Rhea hinted looking at Julia. 
The goddess of wealth then understood what she was talking about. Alicia lowered her head as her cheeks flushed. No, we haven't done it yet. What? I thought you two would surely do it. Julia looked very surprised. Last night, I was just too tired. After dinner, I fell asleep while working. When a detail returned, he found me sleeping so. Even Alicia sounded a little disappointed in herself. So nothing happened. Ria, Julia, and Lara looked at each other. Something more interesting happened yesterday. Spencer fell for an ice elven girl belonging to a small tribe. No matter which world it was, girls loved to gossip and the same thing was happening here. Slowly but surely, Julia's laboratory was turning into the girls' meeting spot. Nowadays, the girls met here and talked about many things. Please enable JavaScript to view the comments powered by Discourse. Comma, Chapter 400-400, Clash of Spirits, Blades and Blood. Attention all readers. We have an exciting announcement to make regarding NovelBin.net. Due to copyright reasons and our commitment to protecting intellectual property, we have transitioned to a brand new platform, NovelUSB.com. This move ensures that you can continue enjoying a wide range of captivating stories while upholding the rights of authors and creators. Join us on NovelUSB.com today and explore an extensive collection of novels, short stories, and comics. We appreciate your understanding and support as we make this transition, and we look forward to providing you with an enhanced reading experience. Chapter 400-400, Clash of Spirits, Blades and Blood. The soft hues of dawn painted the sky as the first rays of sunlight peeked over the horizon. It was an exceptionally early morning in the Dragon Palace, where most residents would still be nestled in the embrace of slumber. However, today was no ordinary day, it held immense significance for everyone within the palace. Amidst the stirring of activity, one man remained peacefully asleep, blissfully unaware of the bustling preparations taking place around him. That man was none other than the revered dragon monarch himself. The previous night had been a busy one for a detire. Engrossed in his duties, he had toiled until the late hours, diligently tending to the affairs of his empire. When he finally retired to his private chambers, he was greeted by his beloved wife, Julia. The couple shared moments of joint intimacy, cherishing the rare opportunity to connect amidst the demands of their roles. As the clock struck one o'clock, they finally succumbed to the call of sleep. While for most ordinary humans this might have posed a challenge, for cultivators like Aditya, sleep was a mere luxury. Their heightened spiritual essence and profound cultivation allowed them to endure long periods without rest, should the need arise. Nevertheless, Aditya recognized the importance of sleep even for cultivators, understanding that it replenished both the body and soul. The first rays of morning sunlight gently filtered into the opulent bedroom, illuminating the lavish surroundings of the Eastern Emperor's private sanctuary. The room exuded an air of regality, adorned with exquisite tapestries and intricately carved furniture, showcasing the grandeur befitting a monarch. As the gentle warmth of the sun caressed his face, a detire gradually stirred from his slumber, his eyes fluttering open. Comma. What time is it? Confusion momentarily clouded his gaze as he surveyed the room, expecting to find the familiar countenance of his wife, Julia, by his side. Yet, the absence of her presence evoked a subtle longing within him, prompting him to wonder where she might be. Where is she? Rubbing the remnants of sleep from his eyes, Aditya's gaze settled on the spacious chamber. The room exuded an aura of serenity, its richly adorned walls bathed in soft hues of gold and cream. The intricately woven carpets, adorned with vibrant patterns, caressed his bare feet as he rose from the comfort of his bed. Exclamation point. Oh, right. She must be getting ready. A soft sigh escaped his lips as he realized the reason for Julia's absence. Today held immense significance for the Eastern Empire, as it marked the first time a Ditya, as Emperor, would host a grand royal banquet. Despite his years of rule, he had never before felt compelled to gather his nobles and dignitaries in such a formal and celebratory manner. A Ditya's naked form, partially concealed by a delicate silk blanket draped over his lower body, stood as a testament to the intimacy shared with Julia the previous night. The discarded garments from the day before lay strewn on the floor, a subtle reminder of their shared moments of passion and connection. With a renewed sense of purpose, Aditya stepped forward, his bare feet sinking into the plush carpet. He glanced around the room, appreciating the intricate details and fine craftsmanship that adorned every corner. The towering canopy bed, draped with flowing silk curtains, stood as a symbol of his status and authority. 
the ornate wardrobe, gleaming with polished wood and intricate carvings, held a myriad of luxurious garments befitting his regal stature. As Aditya surveyed the room, his mind shifted back to the present moment, his thoughts consumed by the impending royal banquet. I better get up. Dash, dash. Located at the center of the bustling Eastern capital, the old palace of the emperor was a magnificent symbol of the grand history and greatness of the Eastern Empire. Once the home of mighty rulers and the center of power, this majestic palace had witnessed the glorious rise and fall of numerous dynasties, carrying the weight of the nation's heritage within its walls. In recent years, however, things had changed. The Dragon Palace, built on the outskirts of Azure City, had become the new residence of the royal family, drawing their attention and leaving the old palace somewhat forgotten. Nowadays, it was mostly used for special events and important gatherings, its once vibrant halls filled with echoes of the past. Yesterday was one such special occasion. After a momentous ceremony, the Eastern Emperor and his four beloved fianques had made the way to the old palace. It was a rare opportunity for them to step foot in these regal halls, even if only for a brief period. As they walked through the palace, a nostalgic atmosphere permeated the air, reminding them of the glory days gone by. Despite its diminished importance, the old palace was not entirely abandoned. Around a hundred dedicated maids remained, faithfully carrying out their duties to maintain the palace's former splendor. Their commitment was evident as they tirelessly cleaned, organized, and cared for the palace. Dusting delicate tapestries and polishing gilded fixtures, they poured their hearts into preserving the beauty of this aging structure. For these maids, their daily routines revolved around the old palace, and they took great pride in their work. They understood the significance of their roles in safeguarding tradition and upholding the noble spirit of the Eastern Empire. With unwavering loyalty, they ensured that the palace remained a shining example of the Empire's heritage. As the sun began to rise, casting a warm glow upon the weathered walls of the old palace, the maids continued their tasks with unwavering dedication. They knew that, amidst a changing world, it was their responsibility to honor the legacy of their ancestors. They understood that the preservation of tradition and the enduring spirit of the Eastern Empire rested in their capable hands. And so, the old palace stood tall, a silent witness to the passage of time, its magnificence entwined with the history of the nation. With each task diligently performed by the maids, the palace remained a source of pride and a testament to the everlasting spirit of the Eastern Empire. Next to the old palace, the vast training grounds of the Eastern Empire showcase the kingdom's dedication to strength and discipline. This impressive area sprawled before the palace, capturing attention with its majestic presence. At the heart of the training ground stood the barracks, a grand structure shaped like a sweeping arc that encircled the old palace, symbolizing unity and protection. Close to the barracks, other important buildings thrived, forming a lively center of activity. The town hall served as a place for governing and making decisions. The market hall buzzed with energy, as merchants and customers gathered to engage in lively trade, offering a wide range of goods. And the Royal Theatre provided a splendid venue for captivating artistic performances, inviting the community to enjoy entertainment and enrich their cultural experiences. Linked to the old palace was the renowned library, a sanctuary of knowledge and wisdom. Aditya, the Emperor of Eistrin, cherished the library dearly, driven by his passion for ancient texts and his unquenchable thirst for knowledge. During the palace's renovation, special care was given to the library, resulting in its relocation near the barracks, granting it greater prominence and accessibility. For Aditya, the library held immense significance. It offered him a place of solace, where he could delve into the depths of history, unravel hidden secrets, and seek wisdom to guide him in the present. His cherished collection of old books, carefully amassed over time, contained a wealth of insights and captivating stories, waiting to be discovered. Often, he would find respite within the library's walls, immersing himself in the vast world of knowledge it contained. The library itself was an architectural marvel, embodying the Empire's dedication to intellectual pursuits. It was divided into five distinct sections, each catering to different areas of study and presenting a diverse selection of skill books. Within its halls, scholars, scribes, and intellectuals gathered to engage in research, study ancient texts, and expand their horizons. Soldiers and Bragonians who had proven their dedication and earned sufficient contribution points were granted the privilege of selecting one or two skill books to further develop their expertise and enhance their abilities. In the library's serene atmosphere, a vibrant pursuit of knowledge flourished. 
Curiosity filled the air, as individuals explored new ideas, broadened their minds, and revealed in the excitement of discovery. It stood as a sanctuary where wisdom intersected with imagination, nurturing the spirit of learning. The town hall was the busy center of the kingdom's administration, where government officials worked and important decisions were made. Recently, the town hall had undergone expansions to serve new purposes and offer more services to the people. One exciting addition was the Auditorium of Spells, a special place dedicated to the study and practice of magic. Located inside the town hall, this unique space had a large hall where expert wizards and sorcerers could share their knowledge and skills through interesting lectures and impressive demonstrations of advanced magical techniques. The Auditorium of Spells was a lively hub of magical learning, where both practitioners and those interested in magic could come together to exchange their knowledge and experiences. The town hall also played an essential role in the kingdom's communication system. It had a dedicated section called the Magical Communication Network, which enabled instant communication between different towns and cities throughout the kingdom. Using a special method similar to teleportation, the network allowed letters and documents to be quickly sent from one place to another. This magical network made communication fast and efficient, bringing people closer together. The magical communication network at the town hall had two parts, serving different purposes. The public section was accessible to anyone and allowed them to use the network to send letters to cities in the southern and eastern regions within just an hour. All it took was a small fee of a few silver coins. Once the letter reached the network, it would be promptly delivered to the intended recipient's address, provided an additional fee was paid. If the sender didn't pay the fee, the letter would be kept at the magical communication network for 14 days. If no one claimed the letter during that time, it would be respectfully disposed of by burning. The private section of the magical communication network was reserved for the emperor and his closest advisors. It ensured that important documents, confidential letters, and vital information were swiftly and securely delivered directly to the emperor. Special care was taken to protect the privacy and integrity of these communications, safeguarding the kingdom's most sensitive matters. Inside the town hall, there was also a unique room known as the Magical Courtroom. It was specifically designed to handle legal cases involving magical disputes, enchanted crimes, and conflicts among magical beings. The courtroom's special features and enchantments made sure that these cases were judged fairly and impartially. In this magical courtroom, the complexities of magic and the rule of law came together to ensure justice and harmony within the magical community. The town hall, with its many functions and its commitment to efficient governance, showcased the kingdom's progressive vision and dedication to serving its citizens. From the fascinating lectures in the Auditorium of Spells to the fast and reliable communication of the Magical Communication Network, and the fair resolution of magical disputes in the Magical Courtroom, the Town Hall represented progress and innovation in the Eastern Empire. In the early morning light, the Emperor, a detire could be seen engaged in a physical exercise known as push-ups at the training grounds. It was still early, so only a few soldiers had gathered there at that time. Aditya had chosen to use the training grounds belonging to Division 5, which was under the command of General Amber. However, Amber and most of her division had been sent away to fight in a war. At the moment, Amber was leading her troops to quell a rebellion in a newly acquired territory that belonged to Aditya. 1097. 1098. 1099. 1100. Aditya, dressed in special runic enchanted clothes was diligently performing push-ups at the training grounds. These clothes were incredibly heavy, much heavier than what an average person could bear. In fact, wearing such heavy clothes would be fatal for most people. A detire's training attire consisted of white garments adorned with black rune writings, adding to their mystical aura. During his leisure time, a detire had taken it upon himself to create these unique runic clothes, customizing them specifically for his training sessions. He had learned from his encounters with Arturo, the formidable general of the Echo Nexus Empire, that training could enhance one's abilities and improve their physical attributes. Aditya discovered that as he progressed in his training, his body's capacity and limits expanded, allowing him to become even stronger. Motivated by this newfound understanding, Aditya dedicated a minimum of two hours to his training regimen every day. He recognized that the morning hours, before breakfast, offered him a precious window of free time to focus on his physical development. 
And so, on this particular day, he seized the opportunity to engage in his training routine, using the morning's tranquility to his advantage. A detire sensed a presence approaching the training ground, causing him to pause his exercises and wait in anticipation. As he waited, he noticed a young man making his way toward him. Elysio Brooker came from a humble background, hailing from a poor family with many members to support. Joining the military was his way of seeking a stable income to provide for his joint family, which consisted of thirteen individuals. While Elysio pursued a military career, his brothers and cousins pursued various other professions. Elysio was the first of his family to venture to the capital and enlist in the army. Fortunately, he was assigned to Division 5, led by Lady Amber. This division predominantly comprised members from different wolf tribes, including the Moon Shadow Pack, Frostbite Clan, Stormfan Tribe, Emberhood Pack, Silver Moon Clan, Blood Moon Tribe, and more. Elysio considered himself fortunate to be part of Division 5, where there was no discrimination or prejudice. Lady Amber ensured equal opportunities for everyone, regardless of their race or tribe. A few days ago, Lady Amber had taken most of the division's members to the battlefield, leaving behind those who were newly recruited and still needed time to prepare for combat, including Elysio. Elysio's selection into the division was due to his unique fighting style, which revolved around agility and the use of a light, sharp sword. He relied on his quick pace and the swift blade he wielded to swiftly dispatch his foes. Even from a young age, Elysio had always possessed exceptional speed compared to others. He displayed unwavering dedication and diligence, often starting his training early in the morning. On this particular morning, just like every other day, Elysio rose early to engage in his routine training. However, upon reaching the training ground exclusively designated for members of the 5th Division, he was surprised to find a stranger waiting for him. Not recognizing a detire, Elysio questioned him with a sense of caution, Who are you? Having never met a detire or seen the Emperor before, Elysio was unaware of his true identity. To him, a detire was just a stranger who had intruded upon their sacred training ground. The training ground held great significance for the soldiers, and outsiders or members from other divisions were strictly forbidden from entering. Elysio shared this sentiment and felt uneasy about the presence of a stranger in their training area. Before a detire could respond, Elysio expressed his concern, you should know that outsiders are not allowed here. Are you a new recruit from another division? The barracks itself was off limits to the general public. No matter how powerful or influential someone might be, if they were not part of the military, they were prohibited from entering the barracks. Observing that the soldier failed to recognize him, a detire smiled and decided to conceal his true identity. I have Lady Amber's permission to use this training ground for practice. Initially skeptical, Elysio pondered the statement. He considered the fact that no one would dare to use Lady Amber's name to fabricate an excuse. If such false claims were to reach the captain's ears, the consequences would be severe. However, Elysio failed to understand that even Lady Amber herself would not challenge the Emperor's authority. Reflecting on this, he nodded his head and said, OK. Since this stranger had Lady Amber's permission, then he cannot do anything. Driving out this stranger from here would mean defying Lady Amber's words. The consequences of such actions would be severe. As Elysio prepared to leave and find his own spot to begin training, a detire called out to him. Hey, buddy, would you mind if we had a friendly sparring session? A detire's interest was piqued upon seeing the swift blade in Elysio's hands. He desired to engage in a spar with Elysio, as he believed that through his ability of instant learning and adaptation, he could glean valuable insights from their encounter. The swift blade, Elysio's chosen weapon, was truly impressive. It was designed to match his quick fighting style, with a blade made of strong steel that shone in the sunlight. The blade of the swift blade was long and slender, curving slightly like a crescent moon. It was about three feet in length, which allowed Elysio to move swiftly while still reaching his opponents effectively. The blade was polished to a smooth surface, reflecting light and giving it a shiny appearance. The handle of the swift blade was carefully crafted for both comfort and grip. It was made of polished wood and woven leather, providing a secure hold for Elysio's hand. The handle had smooth curves that felt natural when he held it, making it easier for him to move quickly and accurately in battle. It was also decorated with beautiful engravings, intricate patterns that caught the eye. At the bottom of the handle, there was a metal pommel that added balance to the swift blade. It was not only functional but also had a special symbol on it. 
This symbol represented the unity and strength of the 5th Division, which Elysio was a part of. It showed a wolf's head, symbolizing the unity and fierce spirit of the wolf tribes within the division. Overall, the swift blade was a weapon that combined agility and beauty. Its sleek and well-crafted design made it deadly in combat. Elysio's surprise was evident as he processed a detire's proposal. You want to spar with me? The unexpected invitation caught him off guard. A detire maintained his friendly demeanor and responded, Yes, if you don't mind. His genuine interest in testing his skills against Elysio was clear. All right, Elysio agreed, intrigued by the opportunity. He had been searching for a suitable sparring partner to gauge his progress in swordsmanship. Facing a detire would provide valuable insights into his own improvement. Taking their positions, Elysio stood opposite a detire, ready to engage in the spar. I am prepared. You can come at me whenever you're ready. As Elysio observed a detire, he felt an inexplicable sensation. It was as if he stood before a man who possessed a century's worth of battle experience. The confidence exuding from a detire surpassed even that of Lady Amber, a seasoned warrior herself. Despite a detire's gentle and kind appearance, his aura emitted a sharpness that sent shivers down Elysio's spine. Standing in the presence of this enigmatic man filled Elysio with a heightened sense of tension. Amazing. I don't know who this man is but his identity is definitely not simple, Elysio strangely felt excited to fight someone like him. Exclamation point. Exclamation point. Exclamation point. Elysio, a skilled warrior at the peak of his training, attacked a detail with speed and determination. He unleashed a series of carefully practiced sword techniques, aiming to overpower his opponent. But to his surprise, a detire effortlessly defended against each strike. A detire seemed to have an extraordinary ability to predict Elysio's moves and effortlessly block his attacks. Elysio's sword swung through the air, performing quick slashes and clever feints, yet a detire's defenses remained impenetrable. A detire's swordsmanship was a true display of agility, accuracy, and smart anticipation. His sword moved gracefully, effortlessly stopping Elysio's relentless assault. No matter how hard Elysio tried, he couldn't find an opening to land a successful hit. Amazed and in awe, Elysio couldn't help but admire a detire's incredible skill. It felt as if a detire could read his mind, always ready to counter his every move with precise blocks. The difference in their abilities was stark, leaving Elysio humbled and full of respect for a detire's mastery of the sword. Exclamation point! Exclamation point! The intense spar between a detire and Elysio pressed on. A detire wielded a simple sword, grasping it with one hand, as he skillfully blocked Elysio's onslaught. It was evident that a detire had deliberately lowered his cultivation level to match Elysio's, creating a fair and balanced encounter. Furthermore, he had deliberately donned heavy garments, adding weight to his body and reducing his agility. Despite these intentional handicaps, a detire remained a formidable opponent. A detire's keen observation allowed him to discern patterns in Elysio's attacks. His experiences from countless past battles honed his ability to read his opponent's movements with remarkable accuracy. Whenever a detire faced an opponent, he possessed a remarkable talent for instantly assimilating and mastering their sword techniques. It was as if he absorbed their swordsmanship in the heat of combat, effortlessly turning their own moves against them. In this spar with Elysio, a detire's proficiency in reading attack patterns came to the fore. He anticipated and countered Elysio's strikes with uncanny precision, thwarting each attack with ease. A detire's adaptability was extraordinary, seamlessly adapting to his opponent's style and exploiting their weaknesses. His ability to assimilate and utilize the very sword techniques employed against him made his defense impenetrable and his counterattacks devastating. As the spar continued, the dance of swords intensified. A detire's movements, though seemingly slower due to the weight of his attire, remained fluid and calculated. Each block, each parry, demonstrated his deep understanding of swordplay and his mastery in using his opponent's own techniques against them. Elysio could only marvel at a detire's expertise, realizing that he faced not only a formidable opponent but also a brilliant strategist who could turn the tide of battle with remarkable ease. Exclamation point! Exclamation point! Unbeknownst to a detire and Elysio, a hushed gathering of members from the 5th Division had quietly assembled at the training ground. Eyes widened in astonishment as they observed the enthralling clash between the two warriors. These newly enlisted soldiers, 
Having joined the division recently, were well aware of Elysio's reputation as one of the finest swordsmen within their ranks. His exceptional skills had earned him widespread admiration and respect. Who is he? I don't know. But look, this man is able to block Elysio's moves so easily. It's as if he has studied Elysio's attack patterns for years. We know this is impossible. The only logical explanation is. This man is better man Elysio. Thus, their disbelief was palpable as they witnessed Elysio's apparent struggle to gain an upper hand against his enigmatic opponent. This unknown figure, who had dared to face Elysio head on, had proven to be a force to be reckoned with. The gathered soldiers marveled at the extraordinary display of skill and determination unfolding before their eyes. Elysio's every move was met with a formidable defense, expertly executed by this mysterious adversary. The new soldiers couldn't help but exchange astonished glances, their expressions reflecting a mix of surprise, curiosity, and a touch of trepidation. Elysio, their shining star, seemed unable to make a dent in his opponent's resolute stance, his every strike meeting an impenetrable wall. A detire, a yielding from the start, remained rooted in the same position, seemingly unfazed by Elysio's relentless assault. His unwavering posture and steadfast defense only added to the air of mystique surrounding him. The onlookers couldn't help but feel a sense of unease, realizing that they were witnessing a rare encounter between two extraordinary swordsmen, the likes of which were seldom witnessed within their division. As the spar continued, the members of the 5th Division exchanged whispered comments, their voices tinged with a mixture of awe and intrigue. They couldn't shake the feeling that they were witnessing a clash between titans, a battle that transcended their expectations and left them yearning for a deeper understanding of the enigma standing before them. After what felt like an eternity, exhaustion began to take its toll on Elysio's body. The intense spy had stretched on for over an hour, draining his energy and testing the limits of his endurance. Despite his unwavering determination, Elysio found himself unable to make even the slightest dent in Aditya's immovable defense. It was a humbling experience for him, a first-time encounter with such a formidable opponent. Sensing Elysio's weariness, Aditya called for a temporary respite. The young swordsman, his body drenched in sweat, nodded wearily, gratefully accepting the opportunity to catch his breath. Collapsing onto the ground, he sat there, panting heavily, his chest rising and falling with each labored breath. The strain of the intense sparring session was etched across his face, a testament to the physical and mental exertion he had endured. Silence enveloped the training ground as Elysio gathered his strength, allowing the tranquility to settle over them. The onlookers, still captivated by the display of skill and resilience, watched in quiet admiration as the two warriors took a momentary pause. It was evident to all that this clash had surpassed their expectations, pushing Elysio to his limits and leaving him in awe of the untapped depths of his opponent's abilities. With his heart pounding in his chest and a newfound respect for the strength he had just encountered, Elysio reflected on the spa. It was a valuable lesson, a reminder that there were realms of martial prowess yet to be explored. As he caught his breath, he couldn't help but feel a sense of determination welling up within him, fueling his desire to push himself further and continue his pursuit of growth and mastery. Exclamation point. There are so many things that I still need to learn, Elysio thought while staring at Aditya. Aditya's smile widened as he observed Elysio, a sense of satisfaction evident in his eyes. You fought well, Elysio. Your skills show great potential. I look forward to our next spa tomorrow. Prepare yourself, he declared, a note of challenge lacing his words. With that, Aditya vanished from the training ground, his form dissipating into thin air as if he had never been there. A stunned silence settled over the gathered members of the 5th Division as they processed the astonishing sight before them. Their eyes widened, mouths agape, as they witnessed Aditya's sudden disappearance. Whispers and murmurs broke out among the recruits, their astonishment painted across their faces. Who was that? One soldier exclaimed, his voice filled with disbelief. I've never seen anyone move like that before. He must be a highly skilled warrior, another recruit ventured, his eyes still fixed on the spot where Aditya had stood just moments ago. But who is he? I've never seen him before. As the confusion and curiosity grew, Elysio, still catching his breath, turned to his fellow soldiers, a mixture of awe and intrigue in his expression. I don't know who he is, but his skills are unlike anything I have ever encountered. We'll have to wait and see. Amidst the speculation and wonder, a hushed conversation unfolded among the members of the 5th Division. 
whispers filled the air, each soldier offering their own theories and guesses about the enigmatic warrior who had crossed paths with Elysio. Some speculated that he might be a wandering swordsman, while others pondered the possibility of his affiliation with a secret martial arts sect. In the midst of the discussions, one soldier dared to voice a thought that sent a shiver of realization down the spines of those nearby. What if, what if he's someone important? Someone, we should know? The question hung in the air, the weight of uncertainty settling upon them. None of the recruits could fathom the truth, that the one they had just faced in combat was none other than their own king, the ruler of their land. Oblivious to Aditya's true identity, they were left with nothing but bewilderment and anticipation for the next encounter, unaware of the destiny that awaited them all. Dash? Dash? After his invigorating shower, Aditya emerged from the bathroom only to be met with a surprising sight. To his astonishment, Julia and the other girls were gathered in his bedroom. Comma. A moment of silence passed as Aditya stood there, the realization dawning on him that he hadn't expected anyone to be in his room. His senses hadn't alerted him to their presence, leaving him momentarily taken aback. Meanwhile, the girls found themselves equally captivated by Aditya's appearance. Clad in nothing but a pristine white towel wrapped around his waist, his muscular physique was on full display. His long, damp blue hair clung to his skin, adding to his allure. As their gazes fell upon him, different reactions unfolded among them. Rinaya felt her cheeks grow warm as her body responded to the sight before her. Innocent Lara, unable to contain her curiosity, shyly lowered her face with her hands, yet stole furtive glances through the gaps between her fingers. Alicia's cheeks flushed a delicate shade of red, memories of their intimate encounter from yesterday's morning flooding her mind. Amongst the array of reactions, Julia remained the calmest, having grown accustomed to a detire's presence. Nonetheless, even she couldn't deny the appreciation she felt for the sight that greeted her eyes. As Aditya calmly made his way towards his wardrobe, he couldn't help but notice the lingering gazes of the girls upon him. With a hint of amusement in his voice, he broke the silence by asking, Have you all seen enough? His words prompted a mixture of reactions from the girls. Rinaya's cheeks flushed deeper as she averted her gaze, feeling caught in the act. Lara, her curiosity momentarily forgotten, sheepishly nodded, her face still flushed. Alicia, her embarrassment evident, managed to nod with a shy smile. Julia, unfazed by the situation, simply observed with a knowing look. Realizing that the unexpected encounter had caused a slight disturbance, Aditya reached for a fresh set of clothes from his wardrobe. As he slipped into his attire, a comfortable air settled in the room, breaking the tension that had momentarily hung in the air. The girls, now regaining their composure, exchanged glances before breaking into light laughter. The awkwardness gradually dissipated, replaced by a sense of familiarity and ease. It was another day in the Dragon Palace, filled with surprises, laughter, and the unique dynamics of their shared bond. This is Chapter 400. A big milestone for me and for this novel. First of all, I would like to thank you all for supporting this novel with gifts, golden tickets, and power stones. Thank you for reading this novel till here. I know the past few months I have been a little inconsistent with this novel but from now on I am going to try my best. The aim is to release two chapters per day from now on. But no promises. My summer vacations have started so I have a lot of free time to write. For every 100 golden tickets, I am going to release one bonus chapter. The bonus chapters will be released at the end of this month. The 30th of June. As this is the 400th chapter of this novel. This chapter is going to be a long one. 5,300 plus? Really hope you all liked this chapter. There was so much more I wanted to include in this chapter but it would make the chapter too long. After this I am planning on reading a chapter on side characters. I have been planning to do this for a while. Please enable JavaScript to view the comments powered by Discourse. Comma, chapter 401 401, Goddesses Among Mortals. Attention all readers. We have an exciting announcement to make regarding NovelBin.net. Due to copyright reasons and our commitment to protecting intellectual property, we have transitioned to a brand new platform, NovelUSB.com. This move ensures that you can continue enjoying a wide range of captivating stories while upholding the rights of authors and creators. Join us on NovelUSB.com today and explore an extensive collection of novels, short stories, and comics. We appreciate your understanding and support as we make this transition, and we look forward to providing you with an enhanced reading experience.
Chapter 401-401, Goddesses Among Mortals. You look handsome. Seated in front of a large mirror, Aditya looked at his reflection and couldn't help but feel handsome on this important day. As the emperor, he wore clothes that showed his noble status, giving off a sense of grandeur and sophistication. His bright blue eyes sparkled with charm and captivated those who looked into them. A maid gently combed his long, flowing blue hair, making it shine beautifully. Each stroke of the comb added a touch of magic to his appearance. His hair framed his face gracefully, making his attractive features stand out and adding to his magnetic presence. Another maid carefully applied coal to his lashes. Coal, made from a mix of special ingredients like powdered antimony and black galena, made his gaze deeper and more intense. The tradition of using coal had been followed by previous Eisterian kings, including his adoptive father, King Ahmad. Aditya found comfort in this practice, as it connected him to the respected line of rulers who had also used coal. Some people believed that coal had medicinal properties, which made its application even more intriguing. Aditya pondered the origins of this tradition. Stories mentioned the dry savanna continent, where people, regardless of gender, used coal on their lashes. This cultural heritage had made its way to the eastern region of the Dying Isle continent through the very first Eistrian king, who had journeyed far to establish his reign. Although the emperor didn't care much for fancy clothes, he understood the importance of presenting himself with dignity and grace. Aditya wore a splendid robe on this special occasion, carefully chosen by his wives, Alicia and Julia. The robe showcased a simple yet elegant style. It was made of the finest materials and had a rich midnight blue color that resembled the deep ocean under a moonlit sky. Golden details and decorations added a touch of luxury, emphasizing his esteemed position as emperor. Looking at his reflection, Aditya couldn't help but appreciate Julia's excellent taste. Her choices always enhanced his features and showcased his handsomeness, whether the outfits were extravagant or more modest. In the mirror, Aditya saw a majestic figure before him, exuding confidence and humility. His blue eyes, framed by his flowing blue hair, had a captivating charm. The combination of his natural appeal, the use of coal, and the elegant ensemble he wore elevated his appearance to timeless elegance. Aditya stood as a true emperor, capturing the attention and admiration of all who beheld him. Aditya sat there, his lips curling into a warm smile as he noticed Julia coming towards him. At that moment, he couldn't help but be amazed by her beauty. Julia looked absolutely stunning on this special day, her inner grace shining through. She wore a beautiful gown that was both modest and elegant, revealing just enough to leave a sense of mystery while highlighting her natural charm. The dress, carefully selected for this occasion, showed off Julia's excellent fashion sense and her understanding of what suited her best. Its design was classy and sophisticated, with delicate details that added a touch of royalty. The fabric, a mix of rich colors, draped gracefully around her, enhancing her every move with a subtle allure. Its modest style reflected timeless elegance, allowing her to radiate her ethereal beauty without showing too much. Aditya's gaze was drawn to Julia's captivating purple eyes, shining like sparkling amethysts. They held a depth that seemed to reflect her gentle and unwavering love for him. In that moment, he felt momentarily stunned, his heart skipping a beat as he looked at her. Her gorgeous purple hair was styled in an elegant bun, revealing the smooth curve of her neck. Aditya felt an overwhelming desire to lean in and place a tender kiss on that flawless skin. It was a sight that stirred his deepest feelings and reminded him of his deep affection for her. In Julia's presence, Aditya felt as if a goddess had graced the mortal world. Her eagle demeanor, combined with her captivating appearance, exuded a special kind of magic. She embodied beauty and grace, captivating everyone with her innate charm. As Aditya continued to gaze at his beloved wife, he couldn't help but marvel at how perfectly her captivating purple eyes, the vibrant shade of her hair, and the elegant simplicity of her dress complemented each other. Julia was a true epitome of elegance and refinement, a representation of royalty standing by his side. Looked enough? With a teasing smile, the goddess asked. The goddess behind him. He can see her reflection in the large mirror. I can keep staring at your face forever, Aditya replied while staring at Julia's reflection in the mirror. He, Julia giggled. Her heart was overflowing with happiness, love, warmth, and pride. You look very handsome today. Thank you for the compliment. Aditya accepted the compliment. But then he noticed that his other fiancées were slightly pouting and looking a little bit jealous. 
Alicia gracefully wore a traditional kimono that represented her culture and traditions. Her family cherished these elegant outfits, which showcased their heritage through beautiful designs and vibrant colors. Today, Alicia chose a stunning silk kimono. Its black fabric was adorned with captivating waves of deep blue. Delicate flowers, crafted with great care, adorned the cloth, bringing it to life. The intricate patterns told stories of nature's beauty, giving the kimono a magical charm. As Alicia embraced the kimono, she seemed to transport herself to another time. Every detail enhanced her natural beauty, captivating those who saw her. Her lips were a bold shade of red, reflecting her strong spirit. Her eyes were accentuated with a touch of coal, making them even more captivating. Alicia's long black hair cascaded like a waterfall, held together by a striking black-red ribbon. It contrasted beautifully with her silky locks, and her bangs framed her face gracefully, adding a touch of playfulness to her appearance. But what truly caught Aditya's attention were the emerald gems that adorned Alicia. They sparkled with a mysterious glow, drawing his gaze toward their enchanting depths. The green gems spoke of mystery and power, adding to Alicia's captivating presence with a touch of allure and fascination. Well, how do I look? Alicia asked seeing Aditya staring at her. Your eyes are incredibly mesmerizing. They're like sparkling gems. I can't take my off you. Rivia chose to wear stunning silver thread gowns, meticulously crafted by skilled elves. The gowns shimmered like moonlit silver, gracefully draping her slender figure. A beautiful moonlight sash cinched her waist, its silvery threads shining with a celestial glow. Her long, silver hair flowed down her back, matching the color of her enchanting dress. Her eyes, a light shade of purple, sparkled with a sense of mystery and wisdom. Rivia's presence exuded a regal air accompanied by a gentle aura of tranquility and grace. Though she appeared slightly more mature than her peers, it only added to her unique charm. Aditya couldn't help but be captivated by Rivia's beauty. The elegant silver thread gowns she wore showcased the exquisite craftsmanship of the elves, making her look like a true elven empress. With every move she made, Rivia emanated a graceful and ethereal presence that enchanted everyone who laid eyes upon her. On this particular day, Rivia's radiance reached new heights. The silver thread gown hugged her curves, highlighting her natural beauty. The interplay of moonlight and fabric gave her a luminous glow, as if she stepped out of a fairy tale, embodying the majesty of the elven realm. Aditya found himself unable to look away, completely mesmerized by Rhea's allure. Her elegance, combined with her regal aura, left a lasting impression on his heart. In her presence, time seemed to stand still, as if the world paused to admire her magnificence. As Aditya looked into Rhea's eyes, he could feel that she wanted to hear kind words and feel appreciated. Even though she didn't say anything, her eyes spoke volumes, showing her longing for recognition and praise. Aditya understood this and spoke in desire and took a moment to find the right words to describe Rhea's beauty. He wanted his compliment to reflect the magic he saw in her. With a sincere voice, he finally spoke up. Rhea, he began, his words carefully chosen, you look absolutely stunning right now. It's hard to put into words just how beautiful you are. His words carried genuine admiration, showing how deeply Rhea's presence impacted him. Upon hearing Aditya's heartfelt compliment, Rhea's face lit up with a gentle smile. It was as if a weight had been lifted off her shoulders. His words brought her comfort and reassurance, dispelling any doubts she had about her own worth. In that brief moment, she felt a surge of happiness, knowing that her efforts to shine hadn't gone unnoticed. Aditya's compliment held so much power because it acknowledged Rhea's inner longing and made her feel special. Lara, just like Alicia, wore a stunning kimono chosen specifically for her by Alicia. It was a special gift that Alicia bought for her. The kimono was a beautiful combination of red and black colors. Its vibrant hues blended together like flickering flames and dancing shadows. The fabric wrapped around Lara's slender figure, hugging her gently and showcasing the careful craftsmanship of the garment. When Lara put on the kimono, something magical happened. Her youthful features seemed to glow with a captivating charm, and her innocent gaze held a certain enchantment. A golden hair chain adorned her forehead, adding a touch of elegance to her look. With every step, she emanated the grace and beauty of a celestial being. Lara had a charm all her own, something that made her truly special. Her beauty carried a purity that went beyond the physical, captivating everyone who saw her. In her presence, time seemed to stop as people were entranced by her natural radiance. 
On this day, Lara looked exceptionally stunning. The red and black kimono draped around her like a dream, blending seamlessly with her vibrant spirit. The outfit emphasized her delicate features and accentuated her graceful movements, making her appear like a living embodiment of elegance and magic. Witnessing Lara's beauty was a truly awe-inspiring experience. Her innocence and allure created an ethereal enchantment, drawing people's hearts and minds into her captivating orbit. She was a vision to behold, a shining example of grace and charm. Alicia's thoughtful gift had transformed Lara into a goddess among mortals. In the glow of her unique charm, she became a symbol of beauty and inspiration, capturing the hearts of all who had the privilege of seeing her. You all look so pretty today. Aditya's words reverberated through the air, carrying a sense of awe and admiration. To him, the four girls standing before him seemed to have descended from the heavens themselves, radiating an otherworldly beauty that captivated his senses. Alicia's lips curved into a gentle smile, a reflection of the gratification she felt upon hearing his praise. The early morning hours she had devoted to perfecting her appearance suddenly held an even greater significance. Every moment spent enhancing her beauty had been rewarded by Aditya's kind words, affirming the effort she had poured into her preparation. Rikaya's gaze remained locked on Aditya, her eyes capturing every detail of his countenance. In her heart, she yearned to etch this moment deep into her memory, preserving the image of his captivating handsomeness. She longed to capture every nuance, every line and contour, ensuring that the memory would remain vivid and cherished. Lara, with her innocence and purity, blushed at the attention directed toward her. Overwhelmed by the intensity of the moment, she averted her gaze and shyly lowered her head. The rush of emotion stirred within her, leaving her unable to meet Aditya's eyes. Her innocent blush spoke volumes, revealing the depth of her feelings in the most tender and subtle way. Enough talking. Let's go. Others are waiting for us at the dining table. Julia grabbed Aditya's arm and pulled him with her. Dash. Dash. Scene change. Marvin Salas greets the Emperor. Duke Marvin Salas approached Aditya with deep respect, kneeling before him in a display of honor. Aditya recognized Marvin as a loyal and dedicated servant of the Eisterin dynasty, a man who had stood by his side during the Empire's most challenging moments. Throughout the troubled times when Aditya struggled with his own troubles and faced threats of betrayal, Marvin Salas remained steadfast in his loyalty to the throne. His unwavering support and unwavering dedication served as a source of strength for the Empire. Aditya held him in the highest regard, considering him a trustworthy ally he could rely on without question. The Salas family had a long history of faithfully serving the Eisterin Empire, and Marvin was a shining example of their loyalty. He had become Aditya's closest confidant and advisor, offering not only his allegiance but also his wisdom and guidance. With the Emperor's backing, the Salas house had risen to become one of the most influential noble families, wielding great political power within the Empire. Marvin's reputation extended beyond noble circles, earning respect from both the elite and the common people. Known for his bravery, kindness, and unwavering loyalty, he was not easily won over as a friend. However, those fortunate enough to earn his friendship discovered a companion who would go to any lengths to protect and support them. Aditya greatly respected Marvin's character, seeing him as a person of honor and loyalty. The Salas family embraced the values of dignity and loyalty, which ran deeply within their heritage. Their commitment to the empire burned brightly, motivating them to serve with unwavering devotion. Aditya understood that in Duke Marvin Salas, he had not only a trusted ally but also a true friend, a guardian of the dynasty's legacy and an embodiment of loyalty in a world filled with uncertainties. As Marvin knelt before him, Aditya felt a surge of gratitude and admiration. The presence of this nobleman symbolized the enduring loyalty and devotion that had fortified the Eisterin Empire for generations. Marvin Salas represented the virtues of honor, dignity, an unwavering allegiance, an unwavering pillar of strength upon which the dynasty could always rely. We already have reached 500 plus golden tickets. Thank you guys. Let's see how further we can go by the end of this month. I took most of the chapter in describing how they looked. I don't think I ever wrote such scene in my novel before. Finding the right word and imagining how each of the looked was kind of exhausting. I apologize if you found this boring to read. 2400 plus words. Please enable JavaScript to view the comments powered by Discourse. Comma, Chapter 402-402, Contemplation Under the Tree. Attention all readers. We have an exciting announcement to make regarding NovelBin.net. 
Due to copyright reasons and our commitment to protecting intellectual property, we have transitioned to a brand new platform, Novel USB Com. This move ensures that you can continue enjoying a wide range of captivating stories while upholding the rights of authors and creators. Join us on NovelSB.com today and explore an extensive collection of novels, short stories, and comics. We appreciate your understanding and support as we make this transition, and we look forward to providing you with an enhanced reading experience. Chapter 402-402, Contemplation Under the Tree. Please, stand up. Aditya's admiration for Marvin Salas ran deep, so much so that he held him in such high regard that he would not even insist on Marvin kneeling before him. Marvin's unwavering support during the Empire's most challenging times had been instrumental in Aditya's journey thus far. Aditya gracefully descended from his majestic throne and approached Marvin. His voice resonated with warmth and sincerity as he spoke, Your Grace, would you be interested in witnessing the marvel that is the Dragon Palace? Rumors of the palace's breathtaking beauty and grandeur had spread throughout the noble circles within the Eastern Empire. However, no noble had been fortunate enough to set foot inside its hallowed halls. From the moment the Dragon Palace had been completed, Aditya had refrained from hosting any extravagant parties or granting access to the nobles of his realm. The secrets held within the Dragon Palace remained concealed, known only to Aditya himself. Marvin's eyes gleamed with curiosity and anticipation as he responded, Your Majesty, how can I possibly decline such a generous offer? I have longed to witness the wonders of the Dragon Palace. A genuine smile graced Aditya's face, pleased by Marvin's eagerness. Excellent. Then let us proceed. Aditya placed his hands gently upon Marvin's right shoulder. In an instant, both figures vanished from the confines of the old palace. As they appeared in the magnificent halls, a sense of awe and wonder filled the air. The palace was filled with beautiful designs, colorful tapestries, and detailed carvings, evoking a forgotten era. Sunlight streamed through stained glass windows, creating a breathtaking display of colors on the marble floors. Marvin's eyes widened with amazement as he beheld the grandeur before him. Wow, this place is even more incredible than I imagined, he whispered, his voice filled with deep respect. There's so much more to explore. Join me on a tour of the entire Dragon Palace, Aditya warmly invited. They embarked on their personal journey, engaging in heartfelt conversation along the way. Aditya shared updates on his recent activities, including the Empire's conflict with the formidable Oracle Alliance and the eventual outcome of the challenging war. With complete trust in Marvin's unwavering loyalty, Aditya opened up about the Empire's closely guarded secrets. As they strolled through the palace's lavish corridors, Aditya's words carried an air of authority and sincerity. He recounted the Empire's triumphs and trials, painting vivid pictures of their struggles and victories. Marvin listened attentively, his admiration for Aditya's leadership growing with each passing moment. After an hour had passed, Aditya and Marvin found themselves sitting peacefully in the garden. Aditya turned to Marvin, his trusted companion, and asked a question that weighed on his mind, What do you think? Have I made any mistakes? Aditya's genuine curiosity stemmed from his deep respect for Marvin, who possessed a wealth of experience and wisdom that made his opinion invaluable. It was a noticeable change in Aditya's character, reflecting the transformative effect this world had on him. Aditya held Marvin in high esteem, which motivated him to personally show his esteemed companion the wonders of the Dragon Palace, despite his status as Emperor. Marvin, a man of advanced age and wisdom, closed his eyes briefly, savouring a sip of the fragrant tea gently offered to him by a maid. Aditya, too, held a teacup, mirroring the calmness of the moment. Your Majesty, I see no faults in your actions, Marvin responded, his voice radiating a peaceful assurance. I have witnessed firsthand your unwavering commitment to the Empire's safety and prosperity. Under your capable leadership, the Empire is secure. Marvin's words carried the wisdom of his years, showing the trust he placed in Aditya's ability to govern wisely. Both men sat together under the shade of a sprawling tree, finding solace in the silence that enveloped them. Marvin took a sip of his tea, relishing its warmth, and then directed his gaze towards the vast expanse of the clear blue sky above. Lost in his thoughts, Aditya absent-mindedly stared at his teacup, his mind filled with contemplation. In the midst of their quiet introspection, Marvin's voice broke the tranquility, carrying a weight that immediately caught Aditya's attention. Your Majesty, there is something I need to discuss with you, Marvin spoke, 
his tone steady and serious. Curiosity stirred within Aditya, prompting him to turn towards Marvin, his gaze still fixed on the teacup before him. What is it? He inquired, a hint of distraction coloring his voice. Marvin met Aditya's gaze directly, his expression calm and unwavering. I am considering retiring, he revealed, his words hanging in the air, laden with significance. It was evident that Marvin had thought long and hard about this decision. Surprise washed over Aditya, his eyes widening as he locked onto Marvin's face. The idea of Marvin retiring seemed to clash with the journey they had shared and the deep trust they had developed over the years. However, Marvin's resolute and composed demeanor indicated a firm resolve. Are you certain about this? Aditya asked his voice a mixture of surprise and concern. He understood that if he were to express his desire for Marvin to stay, his loyal companion would undoubtedly reconsider. Yet, he also acknowledged the years of dedicated service Marvin had devoted to the Empire. Aditya would not hold him back if retirement was truly what Marvin desired. Yeah. I appreciate your consideration, Your Majesty, Marvin replied, acknowledging Aditya's willingness to hear his thoughts before anyone else. The weight of his decision was evident in his gaze as he continued, I value your opinion greatly, and I seek your guidance in this matter. Aditya's voice carried a mix of respect and understanding as he responded, Your Grace, you have dedicated a significant portion of your life to the service of this empire. It would be unfair of me to discourage you from retiring. You have earned the right to find some well-deserved rest and peace. Whatever decision you make, whether it is to retire or continue serving in a different capacity, I assure you of my unwavering support, as well as the support of the Salas noble house. A genuine smile graced Marvin's face, gratitude shining in his eyes. He took a moment to collect his thoughts, looking upward as if seeking clarity from the heavens. Thank you, your majesty. Your understanding means a great deal to me, he expressed sincerely. Marvin's voice held a note of reconsideration as he continued, however, I have decided not to retire immediately. Instead, my plan is to gradually pass on my duties to my son, who will serve as my successor. Over the course of the next two or three years, I intend to transition fully into retirement, ensuring a smooth transfer of responsibilities. Aditya nodded, his features reflecting a mixture of support and appreciation. Your foresight and careful planning are commendable, your grace. I have no doubt that your son will carry on your legacy with great honor and skill. During this transitional period, I will extend my full support to both you and your successor, as the Salas noble house remains an integral part of the empire. The weight of their conversation hung in the air, but there was also a sense of optimism and a shared understanding of the path that lay ahead. Aditya and Marvin sat together beneath the tree, contemplating the future and the continued prosperity of the empire they both held dear. After a few minutes of tranquil silence, Aditya decided to broach another topic that had been on his mind. Your Grace, there is something else I'd like to discuss, he began, a hint of amusement dancing in his eyes. The memory of Leo's infatuation brought a smile to his face. Curiosity peaked, Marvin leaned in attentively. Yes? He prompted, eager to hear what Aditya had to say. With a playful glint in his eyes, Aditya revealed, it appears that my adoptive little brother Leo has developed feelings for your daughter. The thought of Leo's youthful admiration for Marvin's daughter brought a light-heartedness to the conversation. Marvin burst into laughter, his joviality echoing through the air. The news of Leo's crush had reached him through his daughter's personal maid, and it seemed that his daughter reciprocated the sentiment. Amidst the laughter, Marvin spoke with an air of understanding. Your Majesty, I have no objection to a relationship between Prince Leo and my daughter, he declared, his voice filled with a sense of genuine acceptance. I have never intended to force my daughter into a political marriage against her wishes. Love should be a matter of the heart, not politics. Aditya's smile widened, grateful for Marvin's open-mindedness and shared belief in the importance of genuine affection. As Aditya and Marvin immersed themselves in their conversation, a familiar figure approached them with a sense of urgency. It was Watson, Aditya's butler, who had come to deliver an important message. Interrupting their chat, Watson spoke with a hint of urgency in his voice, Your Majesty, the event is on the brink of commencing. All the guests have arrived, and it is time to proceed. Aditya glanced at Marvin, a mixture of excitement and responsibility evident in his eyes. Thank you, Watson, he replied, acknowledging the gravity of the moment. Please inform the others that we shall join them shortly. Watson nodded his demeanor displaying a sense of efficiency and professionalism. 
Very well, your majesty. I will relay the message immediately, he affirmed before swiftly retreating to carry out his task. Turning his attention back to Marvin, Aditya's expression became one of determination. It appears that our conversation must be put on hold for now, he remarked, a touch of regret lacing his words. Shall we proceed to join the gathering? Marvin, understanding the weight of the upcoming event, nodded in agreement. Indeed, your majesty. Let us not keep them waiting. Chapter 403-403, The Empire's Grand Gala, I. The royal banquet had generated a buzz of excitement and anticipation throughout the capital. It was a highly anticipated event, as it marked a significant moment in the Eastern Empire's history. The gathering of all the nobles under Aditya's reign symbolized the unity and strength of the empire. The streets leading to the palace were adorned with colorful banners and ornate decorations, creating a festive ambience. Merchants took advantage of the occasion, setting up stalls and shops along the bustling avenues, offering an array of luxury goods and fine crafts to cater to distinguished guests. The atmosphere crackled with an air of prestige and elegance as nobles, dressed in their finest attire, made their way toward the palace. Elaborate carriages, accompanied by an entourage of servants, lined the streets, signaling the arrival of influential figures from within and beyond the empire's borders. Gossip and whispers filled the air as rumors circulated about the significant changes that had taken place since Aditya ascended the throne. The nobles, curious and intrigued, eagerly discussed the empire's future under their monarch and speculated about the direction of the empire's policies and alliances. The palace itself stood as a magnificent spectacle, its grandeur heightened by the elaborate preparations for the banquet. Guards in resplendent uniforms stood at attention, their presence adding an air of formality and security. Lavish floral arrangements adorned the corridors, emitting a subtle fragrance that wafted through the air. Within the palace walls, the servants and staff worked tirelessly to ensure every detail of the banquet was executed flawlessly. Chefs prepared sumptuous delicacies, sommeliers carefully selected the finest wines, and decorators meticulously arranged the dining hall to create an enchanting setting. As the hour of the banquet approached, the anticipation reached its peak. The nobles, dignitaries, and influential figures from near and far mingled in the grand reception area, engaging in conversations and exchanging pleasantries. Old alliances were reaffirmed, new connections were forged, and the corridors echoed with the sounds of polite laughter and animated discussions. The grand reception area buzzed with a lively atmosphere as the royal banquet commenced. A sea of elegantly dressed guests filled the opulent space, their voices intermingling in animated conversation. The air was permeated with excitement and anticipation, as nobles, merchants, and influential figures from both within and outside the Eastern Empire had converged upon the capital for this momentous occasion. Amidst the vibrant crowd, diligent maids scurried gracefully, weaving their way through the throng of guests. With trays held aloft, they skillfully navigated the sea of people, offering a variety of exquisite drinks and tantalizing beverages to quench the guests' thirst. Their nimble fingers worked with practiced precision, ensuring that no glass remained empty for long. In this bustling ambience, a figure of dignified poise and authority caught the attention of Viscount Edward Ashford. Gathering his courage, he approached a nobleman of esteemed stature, someone he had long desired to meet. It was an opportune moment for Edward to forge connections and alliances, a chance to solidify his position and expand his influence within the Eastern Empire. With a polite bow, Edward addressed the nobleman, his voice resonating with a mixture of respect and eagerness. Your Excellency, it is indeed an honor to finally meet you, he said, his words filled with sincerity and admiration. The nobleman, his face adorned with an expression of warmth and grace, acknowledged Edward with a nod of acknowledgement. The air around them seemed to hold an air of camaraderie, recognizing the shared journey they had both embarked upon. Viscount Edward Ashford hailed from the southern region of the Eastern Territory, previously known as the Southern Fire Dragon Empire. Prior to the Eastern Empire's swift conquest, Edward had served in the military of his former homeland. When the Eastern Empire emerged victorious, Edward pledged his unwavering loyalty, swearing his allegiance to the new reign. Impressed by Edward's dedication and commitment, Aditya, the Emperor of the Eastern Empire, bestowed upon him the honored title of Viscount. Along with this distinction came a small but significant parcel of land, a tangible symbol of trust and recognition. Edward's transition into nobility was a recent development, and he recognized the importance of establishing connections and alliances with fellow nobles, solidifying his place within the noble hierarchy. 
the grand banquet provided an ideal setting for Edward's aspirations, where he could engage in meaningful conversations, exchange ideas, and seek potential partnerships. As he conversed with the noblemen before him, Edward's underlying goal was to forge alliances that would further the prosperity and stability of his newly acquired territory. May I have the honor of knowing your distinguished name? inquired Duke Zane with an air of graciousness. Among the nobility of the Eastern Empire, both Zane and Marvin Salas held venerable reputations, their prominence recognized throughout noble circles. As such, lower-ranking nobles aspired to meet them, yearning to establish connections and alliances. Zane had proven his loyalty to a detail by discreetly revealing vital information regarding Duke Eastgood's treacherous intentions against the Eastern Empire. Recognizing his invaluable service, a detire appointed Zane to succeed Duke Eastgood, granting him the power and responsibilities associated with his new position. Since assuming the role, Zane had devoted himself diligently to the development and prosperity of the territory entrusted to him. My sincerest apologies for the belated introduction. I am Lord Edward Ashford, a Viscount hailing from the southern region, responded Edward with deference, his tone marked by respect for Zane's esteemed status. Ah, now it becomes clear why I did not recognize you, your grace, acknowledged Zane, his words carrying an air of understanding. Please, enlighten me. I hope you're enjoying the grandeur of this banquet. Zane's amiable demeanor exuded approachability and intelligence, reflecting his benevolent and astute character. Duke Zane found himself engaged in conversation with a nobleman whose face was unfamiliar to him. Despite being a duke, Zane understood that the vastness of the Eastern Empire meant that he couldn't possibly know all the nobles within its borders. He approached the conversation with utmost formality. Duke Zane, your grace, please accept my sincere greetings. I have heard of your esteemed reputation and it is an honor to finally make your acquaintance in person. Viscount Edward, I am deeply grateful for your kind words, Duke Zane. The pleasure is mine to be in the presence of such a respected and renowned figure like yourself. Your contributions to the Empire have not gone unnoticed. Duke Zane, thank you for your gracious words, Viscount Edward. Your transition from a distinguished military career to the noble rank is indeed impressive. Your unwavering loyalty to the Empire is truly commendable. Viscount Edward, I humbly express my gratitude, Duke Zane. It was my solemn duty to serve the Empire, and I consider it a great privilege to be entrusted with the title of Viscount. Your strategic prowess and guidance during the Empire's trials have been widely acknowledged. Duke Zane, I appreciate your recognition, Viscount Edward. I firmly believe that the strength and potential of every noble within our Empire contribute to its prosperity. It is incumbent upon us to work together, fostering unity and progress. I am eager to learn about your aspirations for your territory. Viscount Edward, Duke Zane, my foremost goal is to cultivate my territory into a thriving region, making substantial contributions to the Empire's growth in commerce and agriculture. I strive to promote stability and prosperity among my people, while upholding the values and principles that define the Eastern Empire. Duke Zane, your vision is admirable, Viscount Edward. I find that our goals align harmoniously in our pursuit of a prosperous empire. I wonder if future collaborations between our territories could be fruitful. The exchange of knowledge and resources would undoubtedly benefit us both. Viscount Edward, indeed, Duke Zane. I wholeheartedly share your sentiments. By fostering such cooperative efforts, we can strengthen our respective regions and fortify the unity of our empire. I firmly believe that together, we can achieve remarkable advancements. Duke Zane, Viscount Edward, let us formalize our connection further. I propose that we exchange contact information and arrange a future meeting. This will enable us to delve deeper into potential joint ventures, pooling our dedication and vision for the betterment of the Eastern Empire. Viscount Edward, Duke Zane, I am deeply honored by your proposal. I eagerly anticipate the opportunity to engage in further discussions with you, unraveling our ideas and working in unison towards a shared objectives. May our combined efforts bring lasting prosperity to our territories and further elevate the glory of the Empire. Both noblemen raised their wine glasses in a toast, expressing their mutual respect and appreciation for the encounter. With a courteous farewell, they gracefully excused themselves from the conversation, each seeking to engage with other esteemed nobles present at the banquet. The purpose of their meeting, to establish a formal connection and understanding, had been successfully achieved. 
The grand reception hall buzzed with activity as noble after noble engaged in conversations, forming connections and alliances. The magnitude of this event was befitting the vastness of the Eastern Empire, which spanned a significant portion of the continent. It was a sprawling dominion that commanded the eastern region entirely, while a substantial portion of the southern territory had recently fallen under its control. Furthermore, the empire's influence extended to approximately 45% of the Western Islands, consolidating its dominion over a wide expanse of land and sea. As Duke Zayn mingled with the esteemed guests, he couldn't help but marvel at the sheer scale of the empire's reach. It was a testament to the ambitious vision and strategic brilliance of King Aditya, whose determination knew no bounds. The ongoing campaign in the northwestern region, aimed at quelling the remaining pockets of rebellion, promised to expand the empire's influence even further, adding to the already considerable number of nobles in attendance. The gathering of nobles within the Grand Reception area exemplified the empire's diversity and its amalgamation of various cultures, each with its own unique customs and traditions. The conversations that echoed throughout the hall mirrored the fusion of voices from different regions, resonating with the aspirations and ambitions of the nobles who sought to secure their positions within the empire's intricate web of power. Within this tapestry of noble interactions, Duke Zane observed the ebb and flow of introductions and formalities. Each encounter held the potential to forge new alliances, strengthen existing bonds, or unravel unspoken rivalries. The atmosphere crackled with a sense of anticipation and opportunity as nobles navigated the delicate dance of social protocols, tactfully seeking opportunities for mutual gain. Zay marveled at the intricate network of relationships being woven before his eyes. From the grandest dukes to the aspiring viscounts, nobles from all ranks and backgrounds sought to align their interests with those of others, finding common ground amidst the mosaic of ambitions and aspirations. It was an intricate ballet of words, gestures, and exchanged pleasantries, each interaction a delicate step towards solidifying alliances and securing a stronger position within the empire's power structure. As the banquet progressed, Zane couldn't help but feel a deep sense of pride and appreciation for the empire he served. Its vast territories, stretching from the eastern realms to the western islands and from the southern lands to the northwestern frontiers, were a testament to the empire's might and reach. It was a living testament to King Aditya's visionary leadership and the unwavering dedication of the Empire's noble houses. In this grand gathering of nobles, Zayn recognized the potential for greatness, the opportunity to shape the future of the Empire through collaboration and unity. He envisioned a tapestry of interconnected territories, each contributing to the prosperity and strength of the whole. The influx of nobles from newly conquered regions promised to add new colors to the fabric of the Empire, enriching its cultural tapestry and fostering a spirit of unity among its diverse inhabitants. As the conversation swelled around him, Zane couldn't help but be humbled by the significance of this moment. It was not merely a banquet, but a symbol of the Empire's might, its capacity to bring together nobles from far-reaching corners of the realm, all with a shared purpose of advancing the Empire's interests and securing their own place within its grand tapestry. In this grand reception, as nobles engaged in animated conversations, exchanged pleasantries, and forged alliances, the Empire's presence loomed larger than ever. It was a testament to the power and ambition of the Eastern Empire, and within this gathering of noble minds, its destiny was being shaped, one conversation at a time.